And good morning from another cold day in Washington, D.C., and welcome to this, the third day of the 79th uh, virtual plenary meeting. Uh, today, we have some two very interesting um, subjects, but before I introduce the chair for today's open technical session, let me just remind you of a few administrative points. Um, so the first one is, if you haven't done so already, make sure you select the language that you want to be uh, to use for interpreting in the top left-hand corner. Uh, the second point is, if you want to see the full screen, you have to click on the four arrows at the bottom right-hand corner of the of the box, where it, next to where it says active speaker. And if you want to ask a question, please don't write it in the in the chat box. It's extremely difficult for us to monitor the questions in the chat box. Um, but please write uh, raise your uh, hand, which is the green button um, on the the top bar. Uh, I know the, the that that button has a line across it. It doesn't mean that you can't use it. You just have to click the uh, the green button, the, the green hand and we will then call on you to ask your question. Um, if, you, uh, if your natural language is not English, you can ask those questions in your natural, lingu uh, natural um, language, so long as it is either French, Spanish, Russian, or Arabic, and we have translators online who will translate your question for everyone. So with that, let, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, the, the chair of uh, today's open technical session, uh, Dr. Talpur, the vice president of the Pakistan Central Cotton Committee. Um, so with that, I hand over to you, Dr. Talpur. We just confirm we've given Dr. Talpur the the, chip, the floor. Dr. Talpur is not connected yet. Oh, right. Well, we do have a problem then. <laughs> so just Anything? bear with us, please, whilst we we try to get Dr. Talpur on. Dr. Talpur, can you please raise hands? Um, uh, maybe you are with uh, Central Cotton. Yes, he is. he's under Pakistan, I think. Thank you. <laughs> so let me once let me once more um, welcome Dr. Talpur. Uh, good, good afternoon to you. Um, I've already given the introduction for you, so the, the floor is yours to open today's first, first session, the open technical session. Um, it's good to see you, and hopefully you can hear us. Uh, thank you very much, Kai. I, am I audible? You are audible, and you're ready to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. And, uh, Am I audible? Dr. Sarpour? Uh, am I audible? You are yes. audible. I think there was okay, some okay. Thank you. Thank you. issues. Thank try, you. Can you try again, please? And then okay. we'll, hopefully it's all, all okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, providing me opportunity to, uh, to chair the session. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Muhammad Ali Talpur. I'm, I have been working as Director of Economic Research at Pakistan Central Cotton Committee as uh, I'm a basically a, a cotton economist. Uh, at the moment, I'm working as Economic Advisor to Government of Pakistan on national, national Food Security and I'm also the Vice President of Pakistan Central Cotton Committee. So thank you again, uh, Kai, for providing me opportunity. Uh, the uh, today we are going to deliberate on the uh, hybrid cotton 
its past, its present, and its future prospects. Whether it is a success story or it is moving towards a failure, to highlight on the uh, this key discussion, we have prominent researchers around, from the world. Uh, let me introduce my speakers of the session. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Ramasani from India. Uh, Dr. Ramasani seeks to provide the latest farming technology to Indian farmers and timely of an uh, effective manner and a biospectrum journal has crowned him Dr. Ramsani as cotton king of India. His dedication to the Indian seed industry has been lauded by the variety of doctor, doctor of science from Tamil Nadu Agriculture University in 2008. Lifetime Achievement Award to him in 2009. Uh, and he was also declared as person of the year award in 2006. Uh, Dr. Ramsani also has uh, was also named as cotton man uh, of the country by the Indian Cotton Association in 2018. Uh, he is active with various agriculture and policy guiding forums of national and global repute. He is currently the chairman of the Federation of Seed Industry of India. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Yusuf Zafar. Uh, Dr. Yusuf Zafar uh, was awarded ICSE Researcher of the Year Award in 2012. Uh, he has remained Chairman of the Pakistan Agriculture uh, Research Council uh, from 2016 to 2019. He has vast experience of 40 years on life sciences and biotechnology. He uh, joined Atomic Energy Commission and developed uh, the various institutes uh, like uh, National Institute of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, uh, who also created a prominent scientist. One of them is Dr. Mahboob, who also won the ICSE Research Award. Uh, Dr. Yusuf Zafar has held high-profile positions, including Director General of Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, uh, Minister Technical in Pakistan Mission in Vienna, uh, Austria, and Project Management Officer, PMO, uh, at Technical Cooperation Department, Asia-Pacific International Atomic Energy Agency, Vienna. Uh, he has recently retired. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. H. P. Santosh. Dr. H. P. Santosh is a research scientist working at the uh, Central Institute for Cotton Research (CICR) at Nagpur, in India, under the aegis of Indian Council of Agriculture Research (ICR). Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare Government of India. Dr. Santosh has completed his master and doctoral degree from the Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi, and was conferred with the Best Student Award with a gold medal. He is working on cotton uh, genetics and breeding since last eight years. In the areas of molecular mar markers, DNA fingerprinting, pre-breeding, and transgen integration breeding, Dr. Santosh has developed promising upland lines uh, having crop duration as early as 120 days with jacid tolerance, compact plant architecture, vector yield, and fiber quality attributes. Uh, our next fourth speaker will be Professor Andrew Goetz. Professor Andrew uh, works in the Division of Ecosystem Science at the University of California at Berkeley. is a CEO NGO Center of the Analysis of Sustainable Agriculture Systems. Uh, he has broad research interests, including 
system analysts of agro ecosystems, IPM biological control, invasive species, species population ecology, plant uh, herbo, herbivore interactions, uh, tro tropical modeling, bioeconomics, GIS analysis, uh, and various other fields. He is the he has studied cotton IPM in USA, Central America, Brazil, Egypt, and currently in India. Uh, professor has uh, was associate director at NSFS, NFS, a USDA EPA funded national IPM project, uh, and leader of the system analysis head of the IPM Cotton Project in California. He is the founder of University of California State uh, Wide IPM Program. He has uh, so many other awards in his crown. Our next speaker is Mike McHugh. He has spent 30 years in, sorry, I think McHugh Mac is not a speaker. So uh, I would like to invite uh, my first speaker, Dr. Ramasani, uh, to share his ideas with us. So Dr. Ramasani, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chair, for the introduction and opportunity to speak today. I am Dr. Ramaswamy, a chairman of Rossi Seeds Spirit Limited from India, and my topic is Hybrid Cotton Revolution in India. 37.5% of world cotton area is in India, which contributes 26% of the cotton produced in the world. India has got a wide planting uh, window starting from April to August. There are 60 million people are involved in the cotton value chain. Textile industry contributes 4% of national GDP. There are 11 cotton growing uh, states in India. Cotton cultivation is 12.5 million hectare, largest geographical area. India produces wide range of cotton capable of spinning 10 to 120 counts. India is the only country cultivating all four cotton species. India has got 15 agroclimatic regions. Cotton is cultivated in seven agroclimatic regions. Cotton growing regions receive 40 to 80 centimeter average annual rainfall. And on average 60 to 70 rainy days in cotton growing season. Cotton cultivated in wet season and rain fed and also with irrigated irrigation support. We have eight different soil types and cotton is cultivated in five soil types. Maximum temperature recorded in India is in cotton growing area, uh, 35 degrees centigrade to 45 degree centigrade. And the minimum temperature ranges from 12 degree to 20 degree centigrade during the cotton growing season. Agroclimatic zones in India is, is 50, out of which seven agroclimatic uh, zones cotton is cultivated. There are about eight uh, different soil types, which is why soil types are suitable for cultivating cotton in India. India has got three different cotton growing regions based on the climate, soil type, and the growing conditions. Number one is North Zone. 
North zone comprises of Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan states. Central zone, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra states. And South zone, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Odisha. The soil type in North zone is alluvial. Soil topography is plain in North zone. Irrigation facility is 98%. Sowing time in North Zone is at, starts from April last week and ends by May last week. The productivity is high in uh, uh, North Zone. The Central Zone, the, cot the soil types are black cotton soil, medium and light soils. And the soil topography is undul undulating. It has got only 20% irrigation facility. They just sowing time is June first week to July first week. The productivity is low. South zone, the black and red soil, the topography is underrating. Irrigation facility is around 32%. The sowing season uh, comes from June and ends in August. The yield level is medium yield. 72% of the area comes under low to medium productivity, in which 65% of the area is rain fed, mainly in the, the central and south zones. Most of the rain fed area has soil very, with very low water holding capacity, poor fertility, shallow and less accessibility to water resources for irrigation. Cotton crop is highly prone to pests like pink bollworm, American bollworm, white flies, chassis, thrips, and myriad bugs. CLCV is the major disease in North Zone. Verticillium melt, gray mildew, TSV virus, PLB, are gaining its importance in recent years in Central and South Zone. Prominent cotton growing farmers are having marginal land holdings. Our country is having diverse cotton growing environment and adoption of hybrids are better than varieties because of broad genetic base, early vigor, and establishment of hybrids even under rain fed conditions resulting better productivity than varieties. Hybrids are responsive to better crop management practices. For example, uh, it is highly responsive to fertilizer. It is possible to combine multiple traits like biotic, abiotic stresses, and high yield with better fiber quality. The first cotton hybrid H4 was released for commercial cultivation in 1970 from Central Institute of Cotton Research in Surat by Dr. C.T. Patel, which is in Gujarat state. After this, the area under hybrid cotton started increasing due to high yielding potential and wide adaptability. It was the area covered under Hybrids was as low as 3% in 1975, it, which has grown to 11% in 1980, and 26% in 1985, and 1990 it was 36%, and 1997 it, it was 40%. Till 90s, the hybrids were confined to central and south zones only. Gradually, North Zone farmers are also started hybrid cotton cultivation with cotton wheat cropping rotation. Public sector hybrids like H4, NHH44, Savita, H6, Suguna, KKHY1, PKV Hybrid 2, H8 are widely grown by farmers in before 1990s. After 1990s, the private seed industry also started providing cotton hybrids for commercial sale. 
private sector hybrids like MECH2, RCH2, Bandi, Brahma, and Malika were mostly cultivated. In 1990, the area under Desi cotton and Barbadans were drastically reduced, and H2H hybrids occupied majority of the cotton areas. In 1997 onwards, the cotton area started declining uh, to because of volume menace. In 2002, first cotton hybrid with BT cotton technology, Ogard 1, was approved in Central and South Zone. Subsequently, in 2006, hybrids are released with Ogard 2 technologies. Hybrids with BT technology performed with fullest potential to by reducing the yield loss due to volume complex. Private sector released more number of hybrids with VT technology and the farmers were highly benefited and reached 12 million hectare of under cotton cultivation with the, the having the 98% uh, hybrid cotton coverage. There were five different technologies were released in, uh, uh, in different time. And 2002-2006, Monsanto technology. And 2006 again, JK Genetics, uh, event number one was released. And uh, uh, North Seas also uh, got CM event uh, released in 2006. Uh, Metahelix, Life Sciences released their uh, technology by 2009. Interspecific hybrid between G. hirsutum and the G. barbadans has better fiber quality than G. hirsutum and better yield over barbadans. Where the first interspecific hybrid was Paralakshmi, developed in 1972 by Dr. Katarki of University of Agriculture Sciences, Darwad in India. They also developed PC32, which could spin at 80 counts. In the specific hybrids showed very significant hybrid vigor, and these hybrids are having better lint quality and able to spin 80 to 100 counts. After BT cotton release, hybrids like RCH708, DG2, MRC7918, JK uh, Chamundi, Bio Puli are leading hybrids from private sector and it has, it can be, can spin about at, up to 80 to 100. Intra Hasutam hybrids in a public sector like Savita, Surya has been, has bet, had a better quality of, and its spinning count is 60s. Intra hercetan hybrids of private sector like RCA20, RCA35, Bani, Malika, and Brahma are also having better fiber quality and it could be useful for spinning uh, 60 counts. The cotton productivity is mapped in, in this uh, uh, slide, which is which shows the low productivity area. Uh, which is nearly 37.4% of the uh, total cotton growing area in India. Uh, that is about, about 4.1 million hectare is, uh, is low productive area, which is contributing up about 22.3% of the total production. That is 7.1 million bale. This low productive area is covered under nine states in the, uh, in, with uh, 62 districts. The productivity average was 250 kgs per hectare. In the case of medium productivity area, the uh, the yield was between 340 kgs to 510 kgs. High productivity area is, is giving about uh, above uh, 510 kgs per hectare. This slide is. Uh, this is very important. This shows the history of cotton from since 1947, 
when we when india got uh, independence the first two three four uh, decades up to 1960s the uh, total cultivation was uh, under variety only it is it was having a maximum area of 7.6 million hectare and it was uh, producing uh, 134 kg per hectare was the yield obtained in uh, 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 those days when after the introduction of hybrids in 1970 the there were only public hybrid uh, till 1970s and 80s the production was uh, uh, grown up to only 169 uh, kgs hybrid as hybrid coverage increased it from 1990 onwards with the hybrid developed by private and public sector and it has reached a productivity level of 300 uh, kgs per uh, hectare this is at that time the hybrid coverage is only uh, 45 percent of the total cotton uh, cultivated area the area is only about 8.75 uh, million hectare after the introduction of pt technology the area has run up 12 point up to 12.95 million hectare the productivity has gone from 300 kgs to 560 kgs level this was the uh, uh, the uh, the history of the hybrid cotton hybrid cotton has contributed uh, the uh, clear jump from uh, 130 kgs to 560 kgs this is the highest uh, 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 realized uh, year productivity in the country this is the the details is shown in the uh, graphic form there is a dip in uh, the productivity since 2015-16. It is because of the uh, pink bulbworm damage. Wherever, wherever, whenever the pink bulbworm damage was uh, higher, the, there was the yield dip. Wherever, whenever the the the, the uh, pink bulbworm is under control, there is a slight increase in uh, yield but ultimately now the yield uh, level increase has become plateau and now the, the country has to take different steps to see the the yield uh, uh, the further productivity increasing hybrid seeds production using for 12 million hectare is a big task which is, has been, India has specialized in producing these uh, seeds. There are different methods used for the production. One is by conventional method, another one uh, using the main genetic maturity techniques. The total requirement of seed is nearly 23,000 tons, which is packed in. 50 million packets. The seed is grown in 958,000 hectares with huge, with 500 kg hectare productivity. Five states from central and south zone with eight major seed production centers. It is produced 120,000 farmers involved. 3 million peoples are having employment opportunity in the seed production process. post harvest employment for ginning, delinting, processing, packing, we are employing nearly 100,000 peoples. Cotton gives employment opportunity and livelihood for 60 million peoples by way of cultivation of cotton, cotton processing, 
trading and textiles. The cotton provides raw material for 1,500 mills, 4 million hand looms, and 7 million power looms. Cotton export happened to the tune of 3,377 million USD. Textile industry, industry is giving a big contribution. It contributes 4% of GDP, 14% of total industrial product, 20% of uh, total workforce, 12% of world textile production, and 20.24% of textile export. India has reached a plateau in cotton productivity. New variability needs to be created using wide relatives and length races. Hybrids are with better tolerance to biotic abiotic stresses to be evolved to develop. Hybrids with more yield in lesser days of is very important. Focusing more on high production per unit area in hybrids with better agronomic practices, improving fiber parameters such as extra long stable and a strong fiber length in hybrids, mechanization of labor, intensive cultivation practices. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. Good morning. I am Yusuf. I am the first Pakistani researcher who was awarded ICAC Researcher Award in 2012 in Inter Switzerland. Today, I will be talking on comparative analysis of the three types of cotton farming system that is organic cotton and then genetically modified cotton and hybrid cotton, either alone or in combination. My talk will consist for e discussing each type in three sub uh, type. What is the present status and what are the challenges in these things, in these cotton farming system? May I have my first slide? This is the, uh, uh, my talk today, and uh, I will try to finish my talk in the, in the allotted time. So as I discussed, uh, we will talk on each type in three subparts. That what is its definition, what is uh, uh, the present status, and what are the challenges. And in the, in the end, we will summarize that what is the way forward how we can enhance the productivity of cotton and make it profitable for the farmers and for the consumers in a win-win situation so that uh, the cotton remains, uh, you know, the, the best fiber uh, in the textile industry. First, we will discuss organic cotton. According to International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movement, which is now based in uh, Germany, in Bonn, any in organic culture or in organic cotton, particularly, there should be no usage of GMO seed. Then there will be no usage of synthetic fertilizer, no pesticide, and then no hormones. Because as you know, the 2,4-D and other hormones are used uh, in cotton uh, cultivation, particularly in USA and other where there is a single uh, picking of the cotton. And all, we also know that uh, uh, since ancient time, people are using in, uh, you know, organic cotton without knowing it, without any certification, because uh, they were using farmyard manure, they were using, you know, the natural uh, neem or other compound for the control of pests 
that's so it was in a way a, a organic cotton but it was not certified uh, of course because at that time uh, there is no certification system available in post industry area there was a era of high inputs uh, people were using you know the fertilizer at a very high amount and the pesticide as you know like in pakistan 80% of the pesticide is only used in cotton and then you know in the uh, era where the people get more conscious about the environment then people started in the in the beginning of this century the better quality initiative that mean they want to be environment conscious and they want to have a judicious use uh, of uh, uh, chemicals synthetic fertilizer or water or pesticide so the better quality initiative is running for the last uh, 10 years in many kind cotton growing countries it is a very successful program uh, which you know give a new outlook uh, to the cotton product production because <coughs> cotton was using uh, most of the pesticide uh, in, in in the cotton growing areas that gave birth to the new uh, you know type of cotton growing system and that is certified organic cotton certified organic cotton is a very uh, you know uh, is a tough call Uh, thereby, as we studied earlier, there will be no usage of GMO seed. There will be no use of synthetic fertilizer. In between, there is also a movement to have uh, intervention cotton farmers. I mean, those farmers who willingly, you know, decide to shift from conventional cotton to the organic cotton. So the transit period is called in conversion. cotton farmers and there are millions of such farmers in in the globe it is mostly a uh, european you know originated uh, ideas and the cotton connect or fair trade or cotton exchange then you know c and a foundation now called lord foundation <coughs> and organic uh, excuse me and organic cotton accelerators they are the main players of uh, promoting organic cotton uh, at the global level presently despite the lot of popularity and lot of hype in the media it is still contributes only 1% of the total global cotton production um, it was recently reported by textile exchange in their organic cotton market report and uh, the area is only Is half a million hectare, and there are 21 countries who are growing organic cotton. 50 percent of that, you know, 2.4, uh, you know, 0.24 million ton. 50 percent is produced only in India. So India is leading in growing organic cotton. China is. Falling India is about thirteen uh, percent. Then we have a uh, Kyrgyzstan, the Central Asian Republic, and uh, Tajikistan. They are also growing organic cotton. Turkey is also emerging country where they are growing organic cotton, and in Africa, Tanzania, <coughs> and even the USA, which is a leader in the GM cotton, is also growing in some parts. You know, organic cotton. African Union now there are many countries who are willing to join this thing, and they want to strengthen uh, and expand the area, particularly in Tanzania. And Pakistan is also a new country where they are growing <coughs> organic cotton. Last year we have produced thirty-four uh, thousand bales of or certified organic cotton. <coughs> As I told earlier, the EU countries they are promoting. Uh, organic cotton in developed countries and in conversion farmers are rising <coughs> there are in pakistan even there are about 200000 farmers who agreed to shift from conventional 
into organic cotton. <clears throat> what are the challenges of organic cotton? First of all, and the foremost is supply of non-GMO seed. This has really is a big challenge because the GMO cotton is very, uh, you know, gained popularity and it is very well established in the cotton uh, production system. And it can't be <coughs> cross pollinated with the non GMO. Therefore, supply of non GMO seed in organic culture, uh, cotton culture system is really a big, big challenge. You know, the biofertilizer are sufficiently available, although the quality issue is one of the biggest issue. But biopesticide availability and quality is a problem. The efficacy is low. It is a slow acting, uh, you know, action. And uh, therefore, there is a serious damage to the crops in certain uh, situations. The other uh, issue related to organic cotton is a higher certification cost of the third audit party. It's mostly uh, European based. Uh, Turkey has recently started, but you know it's a very costly exercise because they come at a different level and they take a lot of samples and the, uh, the analysis is also a very costly one. And the other issue is the premium because when organic cotton is grown in the productivity is compromised it is a specialized cotton for a niche area so the farmer definitely grow once they are sure they will get a premium to compensate the loss in the productivity at the global level, 8 to 9 percent premium is being given at the market price, but the farmers are not satisfied with that mostly, and they complain that their, uh, you know, uh, the productivity loss is more than the premium which the farmer gets. But it is a very healthy sign that the industrial sector and the textile sector they have no strong linkage with the certified organic uh, cotton farmers and they do the content farming or they en enter into a buyback guarantee. So this is a very positive move on the part of uh, textile sector and that will give you know a surety or guarantee to have an organic cotton um, even with low productivity. But except few countries like uh, in USA or India, the national government policy framework for organic agriculture in a journal or organic cotton in particular is lacking. So these are the major challenges of organic cotton, but it is uh, you know, on the rise and then growth is uh, almost um, in double digits. GM cotton or Genetically modified cotton, which are several names of that, biotech cotton or GMO cotton, the UN system called LMOs, living modified organism. But in general, it is called PG cotton. Even, uh, you know, it is uh, with the Roundup Ready or other traits, but the uh, general farmers, they call any genetically engineered cotton as a PG cotton. Because PG cotton was the first to be introduced in the cotton farming system. <clears throat> it is the most adapted technology in the cotton farming system and almost uh, you know uh, the all the major cotton producing countries like USA India Australia China Brazil Pakistan the top five countries they all adapted uh, GM cotton so this is one success story of the GM technology particularly in cotton sector and uh, Africa is a new entrant. Earlier, three countries were uh, growing uh, GM cotton, but now there are seven countries who are growing uh, in Africa the uh, GM cotton. Technology developers are you know, from private sector as well as in public sector. 
But the pioneer world definitely the private sector and it is the Monsanto, which is, has become now buyer. In addition to that, Syngenta, uh, you know, the pioneer, the DuPont with, with new name, after several merger, they are also growing, uh, developing GM cotton with different days. We have a uh, insect resistance cotton called Ballbard by Monsanto. It has a now in the third or fourth generation. So Ballbard one, two, three, they are all, uh, you know, very popular among the cotton farmers. And then they are round up ready for herbicide tolerance and the flax, you know, for the fiber characteristics in guard, it's the same ball guard, but in Australia. And then there's a white stripe. That's mean it is a three type of uh, herbicide which are present in the uh, GM cotton. As IASA report of uh, 2020, there are 67 events uh, for insect different rates for cotton, including the fiber quality, including the oil quality, because when you take the cotton oil, you don't want to have a possible in that. And the GM cotton without possible was also made by AM Texas. So these uh, trades are available. There are many challenges to the GM cotton because now uh, after a boom of the GM cotton, say in India, though the productivity uh, or production of the yields are stagnant for last you know seven or eight years. Why there are uh, you know it cannot be spread to the many developing countries. The first of all is the there is a restricted use of gene transformation technologies because the private sector has developed and they do have to pay the cost. So the technology fee or patenting rights, you know, they restricted the spread of GM cotton uh, uh, through the developing world, particularly. It is genotype dependent in cotton, only few varieties are amenable to tissue culture and regeneration. Therefore, uh, you know, only you have to first put in the recipient uh, cotton genotype, which is not famous with the farmers. It is not, uh, you know, um, uh, nor, nor commercially grown. So we have to put either in poker or in a kala. And after that, you have to do the back crossing and hybridization program with the uh, commercial genotype of a country. That takes more time, and then they are a mixture of different traits. So, moreover, we know that uh, fiber pro fiber quality or higher productivity is a very complex trait, with controlled by many many genes, and also is being regulated by different factors. So, there is a less understanding, despite a lot of advancement in molecular biology. The people are trying to understand, but still. It, the enigma is uh, not solved. In addition to the technical matters, there is uh, another, uh, you know, uh, hurdle, and that is the biosafety issues which are attached. It is uh, some countries, you know, uh, they have completely banned uh, the GM crops, any GM crops for that matter. But uh, under UN system, Cartagena Protocol of Biosafety exists. But it is a long and very tedious process of approval and commercialization. And it is also very costly. Now they say that 30% cost is on technology, the development of the GM crop, and 70, 60 to 70% cost is on, on the biosafety issue. It is also a long process. So there are concerns which are uh, I mean, true to some extent. There are concerns because in the in the recent history, we have seen the issues of DDT, we have we, we have seen the issue of asbestos. So at the time of its release, it was uh, you know promoted as a very novel compound, but later on it found to be you know very harmful. So there are genuine concerns about the human, animal, and environmental health. All those who far know. Bad reports are available. <laughs> In relation to GM, there, is, there are reports of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
decide, round up, ready. But it is in a different context of the as a chemical. There could be an unintended gene flow from uh, GM to non-GM plants that can hurt the biodiversity, especially in those regions with the other origin of certain species like Mexico for corn or some other you know places where where they were the uh, you know center of uh, origin of a certain crop. We have also seen the development of secondary pests. You know, the secondary pests become the major pest. And then there is the pest resistance. There is a lot of studies on that. And we have seen the herbicide resistance development in the uh, GM crops. Then, although people talked about potential urgency, but there is no scientific proof so far available for the GM cotton. That it enhance the electricity after putting the genes. <clears throat> I will just quote one example. It is an example is from Kenya. <clears throat> that how the GM uh, development uh, in cotton uh, is a long and tedious process, but the story in the other developing world is not di different. Uh, most of the countries uh, either have a similar situation or even worse. As we know that the first global approval of GM cotton was made in USA in 1996. So it's not 25 years of GM cotton in the world. But in Kenya, the first application was submitted to the government in 2001. So then they started the field, uh, the lab studies and you know the contained uh, greenhouse studies and then the contained field trials and all trials were completed in 2010 and then they start discussing uh, these things and cabinet approval they, after 19 years they after nine years you know in 2019 the cabinet ordered approval and the full commercial rollout took place of gm cotton in kenya in april 2020 so this is one example that it took nearly 20 years or two decades from the first day of application to the release and reaching to the farmers. So this is a very long time and it's a painful and it's a costly, you know, and the, the, the benefits of the, the GM cotton, whatever the potential uh, trades are, they were unable to, to reach to the farmers. So what what is the message? The take home message for all of the national governments are that there is a need for capacity building of human resource and infrastructure so that we should not depend on, uh, you know, the public sector, the private sector or some, some donors. We should develop our own capacity to develop and evaluate and get approval of the cotton on a Fast track. And then the modern uh, gene editing technology, the new breeding technologies like the Cas9 system, which last year the developer got the Nobel Prize. We should adapt in cotton because these are in uh, many countries are outside the biosafety regime. For all these, you know, we, we need a very strong political will or commitment. From the national government and the expression of that should be you know visible by investing more in r d as far as biosafety is concerned the global community needs you know a uniform and con a consistent guideline for its commercialization the present system is very tedious even uh, private sector is complaining in china there is unnecessary delays you know in the release approval and commercialization of any uh, GM trades. <clears throat> Beside all these points, there is a need to have an awareness campaign among the farmers, policy makers, and general public at large who are the ultimate consumer of the GM uh, you know, products. So there is a need to, to create awareness uh, for the acceptability that there is no harm to the environment or to the human. Uh, and uh, animals, you know, by using the GM. And 
it is being used for 25 years in uh, cotton as well as in uh, corn and soybean and uh, alfalfa and sugarcane. The third and the last part deals with the hybrid cotton. Hybrid cotton was developed in India in 1970 and it is based on a <coughs> very known genetic principle of atrocity. That when you cross two parents the wide apart, you get advantage. This advantage was very much utilized in corn and also in rice. There is a mega shift in the productivity of uh, corn and rice by using the hybrid technology. <clears throat> but unfortunately, in cotton, you know, there was no big advantage. The making of hybrid cotton seed was a very tedious and very labor intensive process. First, you have to emasculate and then you have to pollinate. So, at two steps, at a different time interval, you have to use uh, labor and it is all manual labors. In India, it is reported that 25 billion workers, you know, they are involved in generating, you know, hybrid cotton seeds. So it's very labor intensive. Uh, mostly it is suitable for rain fed areas like Andhra Pradesh and uh, Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka and other places. Uh, no, many studies has given the reports that there is no edge or probably edge in irrigated areas when you use the hybrid uh, seed in a, a canal irrigated you know cotton farming system. It was slow adopted in India by farmers, uh, but uh, after the adoption of BT cotton by India, and there was a uh, you know technology barrier in in form of uh, hybrid. So the multinational they adapted this line of action, and they put all their trades in the hybrid cotton, so that the farmer cannot copy it, and uh, so it was. Uh, Moved from 10% to 50%, and ultimately it is to more than 95%. Uh, so, <coughs> but although many countries try to develop, uh, you know, hybrid cotton, but uh, China, Pakistan, USA, now they quit the system. They are no more using uh, hybrid cotton. Pakistan approved two varieties, Alcini one and two, but uh, finally decided there is no edge. Uh, and there is no modern technology where you can, you know, make male sterile or make the seed easier. So there is a zero area under hybrid cotton in any cotton growing country except India. So India is the only country where they are using hybrid cotton. And so far, more than 1,000 hybrid cotton varieties have been released. So they are tall, having a tall and bushy plant, and this will cannot allow you to grow in the modern farming system where there is large density. For example, in uh, hybrid cotton in India, the density is, you know, from 12,000 to 15,000 plants per acre. But uh, uh, in the modern, you know, farming system, they are doing 35 to 40,000 plants. So low density and the prolonged season because this is not one time picking but uh, at least three to four pickings uh, per season. So they grow for a longer period of time and do. And the other important thing is that is a very low harvest index for all these hybrids. That means when you add more fertilizer, it will go more to the leaves and stem, but not to the flowering parts. So there's a low harvest index. There's a more bushy plants and more vegetative parts than the uh, fruiting parts. And uh, there is a modern technology is also absent in the hybrid seed development, as I discussed earlier. And with, uh, we know that uh, many patents which are being utilized in hybrid cotton, they are at the verge of either they have expired or they are very close to expiry. Moreover, Indian courts uh, in the legal system, they have uh, given several issued order of eviction of using patents also recently in potato also. So therefore, hybrid cotton in, is an exit path, especially in, uh, you know, irrigated area like Gujarat, Rajasthan, um, there is no more uh, tilt towards the Hopi varieties, which is being used in all other cotton-growing countries. So, <laughs> after discussing
discussing all these things, what is the way forward? So the choice, it depends on the prevailing situation in any country, whether you want to have one system only, the hybrid cotton, hybrid cotton in combination with GM, or, you know, with the hybrid cotton in combination with the organic uh, growing cotton. But all these efforts should lead to higher and sustainable, you know, the lean production, because we know there is a very strong competition uh, from of the natural fibers from um, man-made fiber. And we also know that the people are converting to you know, renewable energy. And uh, also uh, people are going towards electric cars. So we know in the future the, uh, the fuel cost will be either remain stable or will go down. So therefore, the man-made fiber will become more, you know, cheaper uh, as compared to natural fiber. So our aim or thrust be, it should be, you know, to having three Ps. That means the profitability for the people, and people mean the farmers, uh, the, you know, the ginners, uh, the intermediary, the textile millers, and ultimately the consumer. So profitability for the people and the planet that means that it, is, that it should be natural nature plus and we should not harm the environment uh, you know in that manner we can enhance the productivity it is possible and for this purpose uh, you know there is a need for more, more investment by r d by all governments there must be a uniform and efficient poor system for the gm cotton and then <coughs> The recent development of new breeding tools for better productivity must be adapted by all the cotton growing countries. We know that uh, in 2050, it is expected that the population on this planet will reach to 9.6 billion. And we have to double the food productivity. And cotton is a unique crop, is a noble crop where we have all the three traits, food, feed and fiber exist. And, you know, in one crop, it's a multiple benefits and well placed in the uh, sustainable development goals, which is a global agenda for uh, for this uh, on this planet. So we hope that uh, uh, the cotton uh, productivity will be enhanced by applying modern tools, and hope uh, you know that it will remain. Uh, main you know raw material for our textile industry thank you very much and uh, i hope uh, you will uh, ask the question and i will be ready to give them uh, replies good morning good afternoon good evening namaste this is dr hb santosh from central institute for cotton research Nagpur, India, and I'm a research scientist here working on cotton with a specialization in genetics and plant breeding. First of all, I would profusely thank ICAC for giving me this wonderful opportunity to interact with you. And I feel privileged and humbled to be sharing a platform with the legends like Dr. Ramasamy, Dr. Guterej, and Dr. Zafar. Let me share my slides, please. I hope they are visible. Today, I'm going to speak about role of BT varieties uh, in increasing the cotton yields and rainfed ecosystem in India. It is said that agriculture can be as good as seed. And from the farmer's perspective, seed can be a variety and hybrid. Plant breeders develop these cultivars, either variety or hybrid, through meticulous exercise wherein they uh, study the variability in the germplasm and select the parents for hybridization depending upon the target to be uh, produced whether it is variety or hybrid the breeding procedures are used and it takes considerable amount of time and resources to breed a good variety basically development of variety a breeder 
is using combination breeding wherein the desirable genes which are present in the parents using biparental or multiparental approaches are combined in one genotype which may be which may be released as a variety so with selection the uh, performance of the progeny is shifted towards the desired direction so all the uh, traits of interest we wish to have are brought into one genotype in development of variety on the contrary with respect to hybrid breeding is concerned it is important to identify the two lines the promising two lines which have sufficient diversity among them and at the same time they combine with each other so that they eventually produce a very good hybrid how how to decide the goodness of the hybrid that is extent of heterosis the heterosis is a function of dominance deviation and frequency differences in the between the parents whenever we breeders are operating on different traits these traits are bound by different gene action whether they are additive dominance over dominance these gene action and nature of uh, genes has to be understood so that they can be targeted for appropriate product development additive gene expression can be better exploited in variety while dominance lower dominance dominance can be better utilized in hybrid development program when we develop when we identify two lines for hybrid development it is important that the desirable genes are distributed between the two lines so there are two phases one is dissociation phase and association phase association phase means all the desirable traits in one parent and the other parent is uh, relatively poor in the traits of interest that is association phase that will not yield a better hybrid so it is always dissociation phase where the desirable genes are the characters are distributed in between the parents so that when they come in the hybrid they better complement each, each other that leads to better manifestation of heterosis so heterosis maximum is decided by dominance gene action and the distribution of alleles between the parents india has been a pioneer in hybrid cotton where way back in 1970 world's first commercial cotton hybrid x4 was developed in india at surat gujarat by dr ct patel next in two years the interspecific hybrid the histogram of g barbarans hybrid was developed at dharwad that is varalakshmi in 1972 there is another dcs pattern which is a very popular hybrid uh, was also developed which is interspecific hybrid later on the bt was introduced in india and this was developed and introduced as an alternative strategy to the hazardous insecticides which are being used to circumvent especially the bollworms on cotton compared to rest of the world in india this technology was introduced in the form of bt hybrid and with this introduction of bt in india area and the cotton and yield level have increased and this increase in the yield level was combined result of exploitation of heterosis in the form of hybrids higher input use and yield production from bt technology per se but if you see today india is the maximum producer of cotton but this cotton is produced from vast uh, amount of land by the virtue of that the per hectare yields are very low and it is below world average and compared to the major growing countries this is uh, one third of the yields after the development of bt hybrids back in 1970 the area under hybrids uh, was around 40% by 2000 year 2000 but once the bt was introduced since 2002 that too in the form of hybrid the area under hybrid cotton has reached more than 95% by 2021 and it is continued to be so these hybrids there is a study which has been uh, done to compare the cotton cultivation scenario in india with respect to other countries like australia brazil turkey china us and mexico there is a sharp contrast india chose hybrids while rest of the world went with bt varieties these hybrids were developed with the intention of 
having more bones per plant. By that virtue, the duration was increased because they have to have more bones and the plant architecture turned into bushy because the target was to have more bones per plant. Since the bushy uh, architecture was there, the less plants were used per hectare. And these hybrids were very input responsive and their seed production is very labor intensive. intensive. Since there are many bowls, achieving synchronous bowl bursting was an issue that led to multiple pitching. And there was a lack of seed sovereignty wherein farmer has to purchase hybrid seed every year from the manufacturer and there was no scope to reuse the seeds after harvesting. So it is also reported that India has very low plant population per hectare compared to other rest of the world. Today, India has different challenges. Yields have been stagnating for many years now. The genetic base is very narrow. After, recently, a pink bollworm has developed resistance to both the cry genes, cryonacean, cry 2 ab and there is increased menace of sap sucking insects, especially on these BT hybrids, and we are targeting so many insecticide usage on these. Newer diseases like bull rot are, become, rot are becoming a uh, uh, challenge. By all this, the cost of cultivation has increased and the profitability has reduced. So, sustainable cotton production in India is increasingly becoming a challenge in light of these existing and upcoming production constraints. In this regard, even though today India has more than 90% area under BT hybrids, the productivity is very low. One of the reasons which experts attribute to this productivity stagnation is deployment of BT technology in the form of hybrid, especially in the rainfed condition. And India accounts more than 60% of cotton area uh, which is under rainfed condition. These hybrids are known for their vigor. And and they demand higher inputs. Because of their bigger, their and more bowl, uh, the targeted for more bowl production, these hybrids have longer duration and they suffer moisture stress at critical stages of cotton plant growth, that is, flowering and bowl formation stage. So it is emphasized that productivity enhancement in India can come from yield improvement in rainfed ecosystem through development and deployment of BT cotton varieties. Why is so so? It is so because BT varieties can provide higher yields with an option of high density planting. They provide as good protection as BT hybrids can provide with respect to bowlooms, American bowlooms is concerned. And these seeds of these varieties can be used and saved for reuse. And they are more tolerant to sucking pest. They are relatively early in the maturity. They demand lesser input and they are more climate resilient. In this endeavor, a dedicated transgenic pro program was uh, initiated at CICR since 2006. And most of the popular released varieties, which were released for different agroecological reasons, were selected for conversion program. A trial was formulated on equipment on cotton, wherein 21 genotypes were tested across 18 locations in different cotton growing zones of India. After the performance, seven BT varieties have been released for cultivation in India back in 2017. By now, 2021, CICR has developed and released 11 BT varieties which have been notified by Government of India. And these have good yield potential, better fiber quality, and they are released for rainfed conditions of different jobs. These are the, some of the varieties which are released. They provide as good as protection against bollworm and they're, since they are relatively tolerant to sucking pests, they can help in reducing the cost of cultivation with an environmental benefit. It is also estimated that average cost benefit cost ratio under multi-location trial was estimated and it ranged from 1.24 to 1.68. At some location it was more than 2.5, indicating the profitability which they can you share after cultivation of these BT hybrids. In order to uh, promote and upscale these BT varieties, CACR 
He is working uh, in collaboration with public and private companies for multiplication and commercialization. This apart, so many demonstrations have been planned in the farmers' field, especially in grain fed areas, wherein the yield increase was estimated to be 9 to 18 percent over and above the BG2 hybrid of farmers' choice. Different frontline demonstrations were being conducted, and farmers have expressed their satisfaction on the performance of these BT varieties, which have outperformed non BT varieties in some locations even better than BT hybrids. To popularize these BT varieties, seeds are directly distributed to the farmers under different extension programs of CACR Nagpur. Training programs are organized at village level for those farmers who are interested in seed production. Genetic diversity is very fundamental and very important for sustainable cotton production. In this endeavor, we have studied the level of genetic diversity present in the popular non bt varieties of India, which were once cultivated before the BT introduction, and the presently cultivated ruling BG2 hybrids, which we have done using SSR markers. We have studied the DNA polymorphisms present at the genome level using molecular markers. These allelic scores were uh, converted into 1 0 matrix and data one analyzed. And the different parameters of diversity, like allele number, gene diversity, and all, have been systematically studied between varieties and hybrids. And the study showed that there was a significant variation between the hybrids and varieties for genetic diversity. And it was clearly uh, revealed that BT hybrids had higher genetic similarity among themselves, which makes them genetically more vulnerable to the vagaries of climate change and different biotic and abiotic stresses. The study estimated the genetic similarity of 75% among the hybrids, while a variety it was 60%. And number of alleles detected, that is the genetic polymorphism which are present in the varieties were more than the BG2 hybrids. This was first of its kind study, which was done at ICRC ACR Nagpur. When they were clustered based on both SSR allelic variation and also morphological characters, the hybrids and varieties were clearly and distinctly clustered, indicating the uh, significant variation between these two groups. This study has emphasized urgent need for broadening the genetic base of these BT, BT hybrids through infusion of new variation in their parental line through intra and specific hybridization. Diversification of sources of transition and development of BT curtain in the varieties in the background of the varieties which were earlier adapted to that particular mm -hmm. ecological zones. These strategies can provide adaptive plasticity to cope up with the vagaries of climate change and eventually can help to achieve higher and sustainable cotton production in India. We CACR is having a vision where prosperous cotton farmer and sustainable cotton production is very fundamental and central to the vision, which we are ambitious to develop through development of superior early maturing compact circuit based tolerant cotton varieties for HDPS, exploration of new genes through, uh, for better and durable insect resistance, strategies of integrated pest and disease management, and mechanization of cotton prodding from end to end, sowing to harvesting. With the development of early maturing compact second pest tolerant lines, we are targeting to pro produce higher yields per area per time with lesser cost of production so that profitability and sustainability of cotton farming is achieved in India. Advantages of short season cotton were well studied and it was revealed that the net returns from the short season cotton is around 32% greater than the full season cotton. For, uh, this, is, this study is from China and from the other study, which is a recent one from 2017, the net return have increased from uh, up to 69%. It was, it was observed that the full season cotton has given higher yields, but when we come to the grass returns, the grass returns were always higher in the short season cotton. These Increased net returns 
were due to the result of reduced cost of cultivation, which was eventually due to reduced labor cost, material input, insecticide, and other field management activities. In this virtue and in uh, in appreciating the importance of early maturing lines, in order to have more crops per year and having to harvest early cotton and in order to also address the big bull of menace in India, CICR is working to develop promising early maturing jacet tolerant BT varieties which are in advanced stage of evaluation under multi-location trial. Some of these uh, entries have been compared for their yield superiority under HDPS and they were compared with the existing BG2 hybrids. The study revealed that the higher yields over and above the BG2 hybrids were possible with HDPS using compact varieties. It, though BG2 hybrid provided appreciable yields in HDPS, but the hybrid took more time for 90% bone bursting and to achieve higher botanist index, which is an index of per day productivity. Understanding and changing with the time, there is a change in the cotton breeding in the Indian seed companies also. They are uh, towards development of hybrids, processing early maturity and compact plant type. In order to uh, benefit, uh, get a benefit from these work, a new trial has been formulated to identify hybrids which are suitable for high density planting and many of the compact hybrids, the one which is shown in the figure, are under testing in multi-location trial. So, to summarize, I can only say that India has more than 60% of area under rain-fed cotton and these BT varieties can help us in increasing the yields with high-density planting. And CSCR is continuing its efforts for collaboration to see that these, these varieties are promoted and upscaled. And in the back end, we are also developing very promising early maturing compact jacet tolerance BT varieties which are in the final stage of testing. So these released and upcoming BT varieties, we envisage that they will help India achieve better productivity, profitability and sustainability of cotton production, especially in rain-fed conditions and on marginal soils. I express humbly my gratitude to my council, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, my institute, Central Institute for Cotton Research, Director HODs and my colleagues. Special thanks to Dr. Suman Bala Singh and Dr. Randy Ven Gopalan. And finally, and most importantly, my gratitude to ICAC for giving this opportunity to, uh, to express my thoughts. And thank you so much for your listening. Thank you so much. Good day. My name is Andrew Paul Gutierrez. I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of California at Berkeley. I'm also CEO of CASAS Global Kensington, California. I've been asked by the International Cotton Advisory Committee to present a talk titled, Will Hybrid Cotton Be Suitable for Rain-Fed Africa? That seems to be a question that um, poses outcomes for the future. And therefore, I would uh, like to use uh, a bit of lessons uh, that we learned from past failures and successes. And I will use California cotton as my foil. I will also use past evaluation of hybrid cotton in India as a backdrop. And we can look, ask a question whether, in fact, it was a grand success in, in India. From this, we can develop cautions that may apply for hybrid cotton uh, introduction to Africa. Now, my basic assumption is that in implementing any new technology in agriculture, whether it be insecticides, hybrids, GMOs, we need to do a holistic analysis to identify the problem technology targets, to determine if the technology is needed, estimate the costs and the benefits of the technology to farmers, industry seems to be able to take care of themselves, anticipate unwarranted eco-social consequences. This was not done for the introduction of low density, long season hybrid cotton varieties in India. Now, the cotton system, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, has a 
a different uh, suite of, of uh, herbivore pests or potential pests, as well as uh, natural enemies that control them. The cotton plant integrates the effects of weather, as well as the uh, herbivory caused by the different pests on the different organs. It's the integrating mechanism in the system. Now, in California, for example, we had pink bollworm as the key, key pest. It was an exotic pest that was introduced to California, but it has since been eradicated. Now, to do an analysis of the system requires that we develop models for each of uh, the different species in the system, including the cotton plant. We can do the analysis at the level of the individual plant at the population level, which is linking all of the different species together or any combination thereof. We can do it at the field level, integrated at the field level, or at the regional level. At the regional level, we have, uh, we have to, to divide the area up into lattice cells and then take the weather from those uh, different areas to drive the model and to develop this huge table across this region to develop GIS maps and also to serve as a basis for statistical analyses. So these models are driven by uh, weather data, but they also must include the dynamics of water and to some extent nutrient dynamics. Now the model is not designed to predict yields per se, although it does a good job of reproducing a lot of the dynamics. It's more to understand what the issues are about. What the plant model does, for example, is to uh, predict the phenology uh, of, say, square and bowl formation, as well as the allocation of dry matter to leaves, stems, roots. Because the model is modular and has all of these different components, it enables us to deconstruct the complexity of species interactions by separating the ecological core from the bioeconomic and climatic drivers. Because we model the biology of the system and is driven by weather, the models are transferable to other times and places over large geographic areas. Now, all of this work got started back in the uh, early 1970s, but specifically during the late 1960s, entomologists in the Central Valley of California, the area that circumscribed that red dot, thought that a plant bug by the name of Ligus hesperus was responsible for the great variation in the yield that was occurring. And so what did they do? They applied insecticides to control it. Professor Robert Vandenbosch, who was my major professor and died prematurely, asked a very interesting question at the time. I wonder what would happen if you didn't spray the cotton. He convinced a grower to let him use a mile square section of cotton to test his experiments. He embedded the sprayed areas within this section and left most of the section unsprayed. And what they found was that when you sprayed, sure, you reduced the uh, population of adults down to zero, but very quickly the populations exploded. That's because the natural enemies had been destroyed and the adults were migrating in from safflower and alfalfa and lots of other crops in, in the area. The same thing was happening with the nymphal populations that actually exploded off the chart. But this was also happening with defoliating insects like beet army worms and cabbage looper. The top row is what would happen in the unsprayed check, and the others indicated by the down arrows are insecticide treatments uh, of different uh, times uh, within the season. And what you see is every time you spray, you start changing the dynamics, but you also start having an increase in the number of insects, of pests that are uh, arising in, in the field, specifically uh, beet armyworm and uh, cabbage looper. But a very important pest that was induced by these insecticide treatments were bollworms, which really caused an incredible amount of damage. 
um, and all of this was occurring because we had destroyed the natural enemy component in the system. Now with Falcon and uh, Lou Falcon, who is Ben and Bosch's colleague, uh, found was that the uh, untreated check yielded as more cotton of the same quality as any of the treatments. Farmers had been spending money on insecticide to lose money, we have reduced yields. This was the first documented case of market failure in agriculture, so my economist Fred Uri Rege would say. But this isn't just peculiar to California, this has happened worldwide. Target pest resurgence has been a common occurrence. Secondary pest outbreaks due to insecticide use is common. Resistance to insecticide is pervasive and there are ecological and human health issues that often are unaccounted for. So it doesn't matter whether it's Peru or Mexico, Sudan, Egypt, Australia, China, or now India. Well, India has its own suite of herbivore pests or potential pests, but the key pest in India is pink bollworm. Now, pink bollworm doesn't have any really effective natural enemies. Well, most of the other species are attacked by natural enemies of a similar kind, but different species as occur in California. So how do we address the complexity? The only difference here is that it's different weather, different location, and you simply have to divide the uh, subcontinent of India into um, lattice cells, say 17,000, get the weather data from say 1975 to 2015 to drive the models and do exactly the same kind of analysis that we would have done in California. Most of the cotton in these ray fed. They may be new world cotton or they may be desi cottons. Farms are mostly less than 1.5 hectares. It's subsistence farming. Planting densities are about 20,000 per hectare. That's two plants per meter square. Long season cotton is the norm. It grows more than 180 days, and that can be a problem as we will see. Season length depends on monsoon rains, when they start, when they end, and the intensity of the rain. These are unknowns ahead of time, and so it's called the gamble in the monsoon. Now, let's not get lost in, in detail and just compare what happens in India to the rest of, of the world. You find Australia at the very top in terms of production of, of, of uh, kilograms per hectare, and India is at the bottom. In 1970, hybrid cottons were introduced to increase yield and quality, but yields increased only slightly. At a, at a very slow rate, and then in 19, sorry, 2002, hybrid BT cotton was introduced and appeared to give it a production a bump up to about 550 kilograms, which is about a quarter of that produced in Australia. So what's the reason for all of this? Let's just take Maharashtra, India, uh, yields and, and look at this, the trends. We see that from 1970 to uh, 2002, hybrid cotton was being used, but so were insecticides. So insecticides targeted pink bollworm, but soon you start getting ecological disruption and you had outbreaks of bollworm. To solve the bollworm problem, BT cotton was introduced in 2000, starting in 2002, but insecticide use continued. Now, yields peaked at around 550 kilograms per hectare. These are national averages for India. Insecticide use began to decrease after 2002 and uh, occurred until 2008 when they began to increase. Use for insecticide. Uh, a, a gift for bollworm control decreased to almost nothing, but insecticide use for 
Comintern controlled the red line began to increase, and by 2013 were, more, were greater than the pre-2002 levels. But now they targeted white flies, jacids, plant bugs, mealybugs, aphids, and other sucking insects. Now it's easy to see that uh, why uh, pink bollworm is, is controlled by Bt cotton. The same with bollworm, they're both fairly susceptible to, to the Bt toxin. But white flies and plant bugs and, and, and aphids and mealybugs are totally refractory to the uh, uh, Bt toxin, as are some Lepidopterous pests in North America. All army worm is a difficult one to control using Bt toxins. Pink bollworm is the major pest, the key pest in Indian cotton. And a major component of the biology that needs to be understood is the entrance into diapause dormancy and the exit from dormancy in the spring. So in the, in the fall, of, um, pink bollworm larvae go into diapause and emerge the following spring as adults. Now, George Butler, USDA deceased, ran about 115 different experiments to show the relationship between diapause, induction, and minutes of daily and temperature. It enables us to develop this surface, which enables us to uh, predict uh, the entrance to diapause in pink bollworm, California, Arizona, Brazil, Egypt, and now India. The biology of pink bollworm is the same. The only thing that has changed is that the, the pest is now in different locations, but the biology is the same, and the weather affecting it is different. Now, the bond can simulate the growth and development of irrigated cotton. That's the top um, panel. And you see, in this case, it's two with a partial third um, fruiting cycle. But the fruiting cycle, third fruiting cycle could be even more intense, depending on how the crop is managed. Adult uh, pink bollworm emerge from diapause, from dormancy in the spring. And the, this emergence pattern coincides with the availability of buds and bulbs and that causes, enables infestation of the uh, pest in uh, the cotton fruiting dynamics. Toward the end of the season, uh, diapause forms, which are going to come back in spring as adults, begin to be formed. Now, rain-fed cotton largely escapes the emergence of these spring adults. But you can get infestations coming in from irrigated cotton into rain-fed cotton, and you can start developing populations therein. And in fact, you can get the formation of diapause forms in late uh, fall in response to photoperiod and temperature. So there's a conflict between irrigated cotton and rain-fed cotton. One produces the pink bowler, and the other one is the recipient. Now, in 1974, pink bowler invaded the desert valleys of Southern California, the Coachella and Imperial Valley. And this was, it invaded irrigated cotton in this case, and it caused massive declines in yields. Insecticide, began to be used massive amounts, almost on a weekly schedule. And what occurred was the development of secondary pest outbreaks. Pink bollworm was the initial target, but bollworm, budworms, defoliators, white flies, mites, aphids began to become more important than the initial pink bollworm problem. The situation was becoming uneconomic and bankruptcy was becoming more uh, common. Plant breeders developed high density short season cotton as a way of circumventing this biology. 
if you planted the crop at the normal time, but you harvested after uh, one cycle, usually before September 15th or so, you eliminated or stopped the development of uh, diapausing forms of pink bollworm uh, in cotton. And in addition, if you plowed the, the stubble, you killed any of the larvae or most of the larvae that would have been developing in, in the crop. Now, yields were initially high, but it took a while to learn how to use this technology to wean farmers off of insecticide use. But by the end of that period, yields were fairly high and uh, had, had helped to save the cotton industry in that area. By about 1996, pure line BT cottons entered the system. The costs were reasonable. They solved the pink bollworm and bollworm problems. Insecticide use was greatly reduced, eliminating or reducing uh, secondary pest outbreaks. And it was an easier technology to um, implement. And the cotton industry in that area hasn't looked back. Romania has also developed high density short season cotton, rain fed cottons. In this case, rather than irrigated cotton, as was the case in California. And we see that compared to the national state, to the state average in Maharashtra, the red dot, we see that yields are normally doubled. And they can either be uh, hirsutum varieties or arboretum varieties, native desi cottons. So how could we use such short season high density planting? Well, assume we plant short season high density cotton. Emergence of the adults, people or adults from uh, dormancy doesn't overlap very well with the production of susceptible hosts, buds and molds. And if you harvest early after the first cycle, because yields are high, you know, because you pack the plants in, so you, you, you have high yields, you eliminate the production of diapausing forms or will greatly reduce their number, making it more difficult for the population to come back and infest the following year's crop. Well, that's how that would work. You rain fed cotton avoids uh, infestation, and also, if any infestation occurs, it uh, helps to reduce the number that are produced that are of uh, diapausing forms. Cost is a big uh, issue in productions. And so let's look at the cost of, say, Delta Pine 555 Bulgard Roundup Ready cotton in the US. At the normal planting density of 9 to 10 plants per, per meter square, the costs are about $30, $32. At 15 plants per meter square, they're around 48. At normal densities that Indian farmers would plant, say 1.85 to 2, it would be about 6 to $7 per hectare. Now let's compare that to the seed cost per hectare in India. Currently, hybrid cotton seed costs, be they uh, BT cotton or non-BT co uh, hybrid cotton are about the same. They're about 58 to 60 dollars per hectare. Compare this to Delta Pine uh, 555 in the U.S. It would be about six to seven dollars. Now, if we were to have these uh, the hybrid technology in in uh, short season high density cottons and we kept the same price structure, we would see that the price of the seed at 15 plants per meter row would be astronomical. And likewise, at about nine, it would be uneconomic. Even at nearly four, it would still be incredibly high. So cost is an incredibly important component in this. And I'm wondering if African BT cotton hybrids would be as expensive as the Indian hybrids have proven to be. So it would appear that high density short season 
pure line, rain-fed cottons might be useful in the Indian, under Indian condition, rain-fed conditions. It would allow seed saving. Yields would more than double. Net income because of reduced cost would be 2.5 or higher. Reduced insecticide use would occur. Reduced damage from pig bollworm and other pests would also occur. It would ameliorate but not eliminate the gamble of the monsoon using better use of, of water during a short season. But it would disrupt the value capture mechanism that is inherent in hybrid cottons. Suicide rates, suicides have become important and drawn considerable international attention in India. But what we find is that suicide numbers decrease with increasing cotton yields. And the same trend occurs with increasing net revenues. Short season high density cottons would tend to increase cotton yields and hopefully would increase household economy and reduce suicide numbers. So what could we do to analyze uh, African rain-fed hybrid cottons? Exactly the same thing we've done for California and for India. You need to, do, to, to develop holistic analysis of the system. You need to identify the problem technology targets, determine if technology is needed, estimate the costs and benefits of the technology to the farmer, anticipate potential eco-social consequences if possible. Will this occur for hybrid cottons in Africa? I would hope so. Thank you very much for your consideration and for your attention. Well, thank you to all our presenters for some really interesting um, presentations on this extremely important uh, subject. Um, I've just had a quick look in the chat, and there's a lot of good questions that are in the chat. But unfortunately, if English is not your first language, you're not going to be able to participate in those. So can I please, please, please ask you uh, not to ask your questions in the chat, but to raise um, your hand. That's the green button. And um, so that we can at least um, ask those very interesting questions uh, to the whole audience. Um, so please, can I ask for some questions now? Um, Dr. Cranthy will be assisting me in looking for uh, questions. So uh, Keshav, if you see any good ones and uh, you feel that um, they should be asked um, in this open forum, uh, please feel free to intervene. Yeah, thank you, Kai. Uh, there are a lot of questions and I think... Uh, we need to pull together a few. I did an attempt, so probably I'll just uh, go through and I'll be requesting the speakers to address them. The first question is from uh, Dr. Sabesh. Um, this is to Dr. Ramaswamy, and he's asking, are hybrids losing their potential? Because it appears that India's yields are going down. Can we have all the four speakers? Uh, can we give the floor to all of them? Is it possible to have all the four speakers on? Uh, a speaker, okay. can you raise your hand so that we can uh, distinguish you from the list? Thank you. Yes, they're doing it now. So, Professor. Gutierrez and Dr. Santosh have raised their hand. If we can um, give them the floor. They have the floor. The Dr. Ramasami is not on, not raised his hand already. All right. It's 
So, Keshav, who was that question to in particular? That was to Dr. Ramaswamy. But um, yes, what we can do is probably when Dr. Ramaswamy comes back, uh, we may have to request him to uh, take the floor. Uh, is Dr. Yusuf Zafar there? We could uh, request him to come on stage. Yes, he's. I can see his name. So. Let's give uh, Dr. Yusuf Safa the floor, please. Yeah, we have limit, limit. We have ready. All right. Okay. Limit. So just, just remove me from, from there. Then. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, Kai, what I suggest is like probably we'll take the questions first to the two speakers, which is Professor Gutierrez and to Dr. Santosh, and then we can uh, get Dr. Zafar and Dr. Ramasamy onto the floor. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so um, there's a question from Dr. Balasurumani to Professor Gutierrez. Uh, he's asking, can India increase yields by shifting from hybrids to varieties? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Professor Gutierrez. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, admit that uh, my slide on prices of uh, uh, BT hybrid cotton in India are about 60% uh, higher than they should be. So I apologize for that error in the slide, but it does not change the basic thrust of, uh, of the economic uh, impact and uh, limitation. Uh, it would seem that uh, one could shift to uh, short season, high density, uh, pure line variety cottons, and it would uh, basically avoid pink bollworm, uh, initially in the spring and also in the fall. And if this were adopted on an area-wide basis, uh, pink bollworm would tend to be a minor problem in the region. And so long as they didn't get back on the insecticide treadmill, uh, it would continue to be so. So I think it, it, it could be done, yes. Uh, the next question, Professor Gutierrez, uh, to you is from Marco Matunga. He's asking, uh, can moisture stress, can the late season moisture stress in, explain, uh, I'm sorry, can the late season moisture stress in India uh, explain low yields in the country? Well, I mean, um, yields in rain-fed cotton probably are related to the amount of moisture, the amount of rainfall that you get. And so if moisture stress starts occurring uh, too early, late in the season, you would start getting uh, yield declines simply by not filling bowls or also aborting uh, bowls that are still forming. Um, Dr. Sabesh has this question to you, uh, Professor Gutierrez. He says many studies have reported that BT cottons, uh, BT cotton hybrids are suitable for irrigated conditions, irrigated and uh, irrigated and high input conditions. Uh, are BT cotton hybrids suitable for Africa? I don't think any, uh, we can answer that question until we do the analysis. And that was the last slide that I, I presented. Uh, you need to know the biology. Um, the growing of cotton has um, ecological basis driven by weather, and it has economic and social um, uh, parameters that are on top of that. And to be able to answer the question of uh, is a technology needed requires that you understand the biology. And once you understand the biology and can model and, and uh, um, use it in the analysis, then you can start answering those kinds of questions. Thank you, Professor Gutierrez. Um, now, there are a few questions uh, to Dr. Santosh. One of them is, uh, the, uh, this is from Mr. Rajiv Barwa. He's asking, what are India's plans for BT varieties? Dr. Santosh, are you there? A while, please.
Dr. Santosh had the floor. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Santosh, yeah, okay. There's a question from Dr. Ram. Uh, this is from Dr. Ram Kumar. It's an interesting question. He says, in developed countries, there's a strong producer-led efforts when it comes to adopting technologies. How is the Indian Council of Agriculture Research involved at such grassroots level? Uh, at such grassroots level, this is important. So uh, that's a good question, sir. I agree. And uh, as per I am aware, uh, I, we at CACR is a research organization uh, where the basic mandate is research, and uh, we are uh, endorse, uh, endeavoring with the development of varieties. Uh, but to carry forward those variety to the farmer, we have a different uh, layered uh, organizations like seed, seed producing agencies. Then uh, there are uh, the extension agencies, state departments, and our uh, institute is working closely with them uh, to his best to see that these varieties are taken to the farmers. And there is this question from Mr. Rajiv Barwa. He's asking, what are India's plans uh, for the promotion, adoption of BT cotton varieties? What's the way forward? So uh, with respect to uh, BT varieties, uh, when the program started, uh, the pink bullworm was not a menace at all on the uh, BT cotton. And uh, the varieties which are now developed and released are almost like uh, semi-compact and uh, 150 to 160 days duration. And now uh, we are embarking upon developing uh, varieties which are uh, still earlier than that and more amenable to HTPS so that we can develop, we can have higher yields under HTPS with lesser duration so that pink bolon can also be addressed. As far as uh, our institute envisages, we don't see any uh, potential transgenic event which is found to be addressing the pink bolon problem which is rampant in India right now. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, thank you, Professor Gutierrez, and uh, thank you, Dr. Santosh. Your presentations were absolutely brilliant. Uh, we enjoyed. Uh, probably we will be giving the floor to the next two speakers. Uh, these yes. were the set of questions to the two of you. Thank you very much for answering them too. Thank you. Thank you. Can we give the floor to Dr. Yusuf Zafar and uh, Dr. Ramaswamy, please? Dr. Zafar has the floor. Excellent. Professor Zafar, this question, uh, like, can you hear us? Professor Zafar? He has the floor, but he cannot hear you. He's okay. on. Professor Zafar, yes, can I you can. hear me? Yes, okay, of excellent. course I can hear you. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, there was a lot of learning from it. Uh, these questions, I'm just reading them. There are three questions for you, Professor Zafar. One is uh, from Dr. Sabesh. Uh, he says, with the advantages of low chemical inputs in Africa and with the low labor costs, uh, do you think Africa will be able to lead on organic cotton? cotton has a very specific niche area and certified organic cotton is a very tedious task and it relates to, to you know many factors first of all because uh, some yield with the conventional high end and I told you that, uh, earlier in my talk that the uh, ability quality effective biopesticide also one of the uh, in a certified organic cotton certification cost by for get by the professional industry is another input cost so keeping all in this in mind you know it will remain uh, in a very selected area selected you know, uh, consumers and uh, uh, it will remain at a low level. It will never reach to, you know, uh, the level of uh, conventional cotton. Thank you, Professor Zafar. Uh, there's this question from... In. 
Okay. Uh, Mr. Marco Matunga is asking this question. How serious is the effect of gene flow from GM cotton to the environment? Have Pakistan and India started to notice the effect on biodiversity? I mean, fortunately, in Pakistan, we have introduced uh, BG cotton since 2008 officially, and almost 98% area is under BG or GM cotton. And so far, <laughs> because, uh, you know, the arbor has uh, now pushed to almost negligible area, so we didn't see any you know, incident of uh, gene flow to those, uh, you know, uh, cross by, uh, cross by barriers. Yes. So there is no incident reported so far from Pakistan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zafar. There is uh, a question from Saira Bano. And the question is, what kind of cottons uh, would give the best benefit ratio of production? Or does it all depend only on the soil conditions? Soil is also uh, very important. I mean, a soil is like a factory, you know, uh, where you produce a plant, uh, and that is applicable to all. Uh, but besides soil, there are many more factors, uh, particularly for a long duration cotton crop. So soil do play a major role. Is there any specific kind of cotton which is better than the others of the three, the GM cottons, organic and uh, hybrid cottons, in terms of uh, their productive potential? As in my talk, and uh, by screening all the literature so far, you know, the revolutionary and uh, very big change occurs in uh, hybrid technology in rice as well as in uh, uh, corn, particularly corn. In Pakistan, we used to get 20 mon, I mean, 40 kgs, one mon. Uh, now it is 120, 130 is a common thing in uh, uh, hybrid corn. But unfortunately, we haven't seen such a, uh, you know, mega shift in uh, high, uh, cotton hybrid. So it is a, uh, I will say, is a dying technology in terms of uh, labor intensive to produce the seed and, uh, you know, not conforming to the modern agriculture practices in cotton. For example, like look at even China in Xinjiang provinces, they have gone to the US model, you know, heavy mechanized and the high plant density, you know, uh, harvesting through machines. So, uh, uh, and uh, it's a remarkable production. I mean, uh, 85 to 90 percent production only in Xinjiang provinces. So, uh, uh, in my view, you know, this is uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the government will to develop, you know, uh, uh, R&D sector that will uh, contribute to the uh, higher productivity of any crop for that matter and cotton is also part of that. Cotton needs more, you know, <laughs> attention because uh, it attracts a lot of many insects, uh, pests and diseases as compared to say wheat or rice. So uh, therefore, uh, you know, the public sector involvement is all the time required, uh, you know, for having a successful cotton sector in the country. Thank you, Dr. Zafar. Uh, there's one more question. It's about the sustainability of uh, BT cottons uh, and, in fact, of biotech cottons, per se. The question is from CCRI Multan. And uh, the person is asking, bollworms are developing resistance to BT cotton and weeds are developing resistance to herbicides. So, therefore, it has an impact on herbicide-tolerant uh, cotton. Uh, how do you think we can maintain the sustainability of these biotech cotton technologies? You know, in any life sciences thing is a, is a dynamic or evolutionary process. When we are technology, I mean, the, the microorganism or uh, the I mean, will also develop, you know, certain tools and techniques to overcome 
ongoing war and uh, we, we have uh, you know the science is done by the uh, mankind and also by the living organism so uh, my you know uh, uh, trust should be that uh, the r and d sector uh, you know should be to make uh, very strong active and indigenous research it should be carried out with more uh, you know uh, cooperation among the developing and developed nations less barrier in fact you know uh, the there is no indigenous advancement by the developing countries uh, particularly like pakistan or india where they have developed their own genes for different herbicides you know for uh, and making different combinations uh, making different uh, you know uh, uh, with the new technologies like gene editing they can work more easily you know but unfortunately the uh, the r and d sector is not that strong uh, this is unfortunate and uh, therefore we are dependent on uh, uh, getting the genotypes even uh, from uh, uh, developed nations uh, uh, and unfortunately unlike of uh, uh, you know semit or iri or iclisat or ricarda we don't have any international you know such uh, organization to deal with the cotton so there is less uh, uh, you know uh, what is called distribution of uh, new germplasm among the uh, cotton growing countries so there is a narrow diversity very narrow diversity in a, in all the countries you know and uh, uh, the r and d is weaker and there is no less incentive like in pakistan you know the area has gone down because uh, you, uh, the government has given more incentives to sugarcane as compared to cotton so <laughs> the impact is obvious that uh, sugarcane has made inroad in those areas which were called the golden area for cotton so now government realized the mistake and now they are trying to overcome that because uh, the raw material to textile industry is cotton uh, so, the, so there are many multiple factors which results in you know low yields uh, if we keep uh, you know uh, there is a lot of uh, potential in uh, gene technologies and uh, and we can resolve so many problems uh, and it is not panacea you know it is not uh, forever you have to keep on struggling to add new genes uh, new technologies like you are now we have fast breeding technologies new breeding techniques these are available so we must adapt all those new technologies for making cotton a profitable crop as compared to man made fibers Thank you, Doctor Zafar. And in the meantime, uh, there are actually four or five more questions to you, Professor Zafar. Uh, I'm requesting the organizers to see if we can also try to get Doctor Ramaswamy on the floor because there are six questions to him. I do yes. not know if he'll be able to take all of them, but uh, Keshav, he's, he's 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 uh, he's he's not online at the moment, so we will have to send those to him uh, okay. separately. Uh, uh, I am conscious about the time, and I notice that there are three in that have put their hands up. Um, so, have we got time for any more questions? Uh, if so, I think we should take one of the ones who've raised their hands. Yeah, that's right, Kai. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we give the floor to? Um, uh dr tanga please who's raised his hand and then if we've got time we'll go to dr Nag nagi dr tanga has the floor thank you Tanga. Dr. Tanga, you have the floor now. You can speak. I think we I think we have lost Dr. Tanga. 
okay, let's uh, let's progress and let's try uh, uh, Dr. Nagib. Um, can we give uh, Dr. Nagib the floor? Uh, remember yesterday, Dr. Nagib, we had great difficulties connecting with you, so hopefully we can do that today. Dr. Tanga is still online. Can you try again? Yes, we can. Dr. Tanga, can you hear us? I can Dr. see. Tanga, we cannot hear you. Yes. Dr. Tang, can you speak, please? We can see you, but we can't hear you. No, that's not working for some reason. Okay, let's. Um, Dr. Tang, have you put your question in the chat? At least we know then we can capture that question. Um, uh, can we uh, please give the floor to uh, Dr. Nag Nagib and see if we can get a question there? The floor. You have the floor. That's okay. Okay. He's not coming through either. Let's. Um, uh, I know Dr. Yes. Uh, let's, oh, he, he's there. He is. Dr. Nagib. Yes. Welcome. Oh, we've lost you. A brief, briefly got you, and then we've lost you. Okay, we, we need to uh, move on because we're running out of time. And I know Dr. Santosh had a, a number of really interesting questions in the chat. Uh, can we give the floor to Dr. Santosh, please? And Yeah, thank you. I'm audible? Yes, you are, Dr. Santosh. Let, yeah, uh, over I, the floor. I, yeah, thank you. I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Gutierrez for insightful presentation. Just one thing I want to learn. Uh, we have American bollworm in India, uh, which is a major pest still. And uh, the BT varieties, uh, the BT technology is still working well for these American bollworms. Why is so that the uh, non-GM cotton uh, is considered better than the BT varieties with the fact that the short duration varieties can be developed both in BT and non-BT background? Can we give the floor to Professor Gutierrez, please, to answer? Can we please give the floor to Professor Gutierrez? Kai, can you hear me? Yes, there we go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, if we, unless we can look at the total dynamics of the system, it is difficult to know what the major pests are and how important each of them might be. So, for example, in California, they thought that bollworm was a primary pest. It turned out to be a secondary pest. They thought that Ligus hesperus, the bug, was a primary pest. It turned out to be a non-pest. And in both cases, if the assumption was that these were pests, then it stimulated insecticide treatments or other technologies to control them. For American bollworm, which is a different species, Helicoverpa armigera, need to do studies to determine if in fact it is a primary or a secondary pest and under what conditions uh, does it arise and cause damage. And the way to do this is to do the experiments in an isolated situation where you know you have pink bollworm and you don't treat it and then to see if in fact you get infestations of American bollworm. And then you can start identifying on a regional basis the relative threat posed by each of these different species. Now, the reason that we did modeling was that different areas, even within the state of California, are going to have different phenologies and different dynamics of each of these pests. 
if you model the biology and you drive it with weather, then you can examine these dynamics in any of these locations. It provides a tool to see the things that we can't observe by set piece field experiments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gutierrez. Um, I'm afraid we have overshot our time and there are still questions coming in. Um, we are attempting to capture all those questions and we'll pass them on to the presenters. Um, so now I would like to hand back to the chair, Dr. Talpur, um, for you to formally close this session and then we can then move immediately into the uh, session with Dr. Cranthy. Um, Dr. Talpur, are you, has he got the chair, has he got the floor? No, I sent a message to raise his hand. He's there. He's under Pakistan. Thank you. Am I audible? Dr. Talpur. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Kai. Uh, thank you very much. I, I highly appreciate the excellent uh, presentations of, of the speakers. Uh, they took us through the uh, latest updates and the technology regarding cotton. I highly appreciate their work. Uh, we all Okay, I think uh, I think the technology has got in the way again there. Um, but um, if you can't hear me, Dr. Talpur, we've we lost you, and I know you're back now. But um, I'd like to thank you for agreeing to share today's session. Um, thank you to you and Pakistan. And I will now hand over to uh, the ICAC chief scientist, uh, Dr. Keshav Kranthi, um, to introduce the next session, which is the discussion on the working paper, uh, the working technical paper. Uh, Dr. Cranthy, you have the floor. Just put your microphone on, Keshav. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the ICAC has the pleasure of proposing three topics for the technical seminar 2022. The first topic is regenerative agriculture. Which practices can combat climate change most effectively? As we all know, soils across the world are degrading rapidly. Soils are subjected to continuous erosion, chemical pollution, decarbonization, desertification, and loss of fertility and biodiversity. Agriculture scientists have issued warnings that without proactive measures to build and protect soil organic matter, soil health and soil fertility, within 50 years, mankind could lose the capability to feed and clothe the world and combat the ill effects of global warming. The technical seminar will discuss the recent studies on regenerative agriculture practices, farming systems, and their impact on cotton production practices and the value chain. The second topic is Will cotton production be viable without government subsidies? Some governments provide input subsidies for fertilizers, agrochemicals, irrigation, agriculture machinery, market support price, and insurance against crop losses. Subsidies not only insulate farmers from price risks, they also help to promote cotton production and foster artificial revenues. Where governments do not offer input subsidies or insurance, farmers lose their global competitive edge. The technical session will discuss the economic viability of cotton production across the globe in the absence of government subsidies and support. The third topic is the sustainability challenge of biotech genetically modified cotton. Biotech cotton has completed 25 years of cultivation. It has been approved in 19 countries. Reports indicate significant economic benefits due to effective control of bollworms and weeds. However, the sustainability of 
white cotton is now under threat. Hormone resistance to Bt cotton has been recorded in the United States, India, and Pakistan. Glyphosate resistance was recorded in 13 wheat species, each in the United States and Australia, and eight each in Argentina and Brazil. Insecticide usage has been increasing over the past 10 years in India, Pakistan, China, Brazil, and the United States. The seminar will discuss strategies to improve sustainability of the existing biotech cotton events while exploring the deployment of new technologies to enhance the endurance of biotech cotton. Thank you very much. Can we just uh, please just show the first slide again that there was a technical hitch there and I'm, I'm aware that you may not have seen it um, so that you have all three slides. Caroline, I'll let you know when it's on the screen. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the ICAC has the pleasure of proposing three topics for the Technical Seminar 2022. It's not showing. The first topic is... The second topic... Go back, please. We're on topic two. That's it. Thank you. That's the right. The second topic is perhaps just leave that slide uh, up. Um, Caroline, just leave the leave the slide up for for topic one. If which practices can combat climate change most effectively? As we all know, soils across the world are degrading rapidly. Soils are subjected to continuous erosion, chemical pollution, decarbonization, desertification, and loss of fertility and biodiversity. Agriculture scientists have issued warnings that without proactive measures to build and protect soil organic matter, soil health and soil fertility, within 50 years, mankind could lose the capability to feed and clothe the world and combat the ill effects of global warming. The technical seminar will discuss the recent studies on regenerative agriculture practices, farming systems, and their impact on cotton production practices and the value chain. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. I apologize for that technical hitch. Uh, uh, Dr. Cranthy, I'll now hand back to you for you to take the floor, please. Put your mic on, please, Keshav. Yeah, thank you very much, Kai. Uh, all these three topics were picked up from the responses that we've been getting uh, through our interactions with different countries and the coordinating agencies, scientists, researchers, and farmers. So I'd love, uh, like to request the coordinating agencies to uh, please give their comments and their preferences, which topic would be most suitable for the next technical session of 2022. So we have uh, we have uh, Pakistan. Let's take uh, Pakistan first, followed by uh, Russia, and then followed by the USA with Patrick Patnett. Uh, Pakistan, can you give the floor to Pakistan, please? Um, Pakistan has the floor. Yes. Currently, can you read it? Because we couldn't uh, see. You have, you have the floor now. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, yes, you have to be audible now. Yeah, okay, Dr. Kranthi, uh, can you repeat, please? Can, can you read it? Uh, because we were, were not able to see the, the, the screen. Um, the like, probably, uh, like, can we repeat the presentation, Caroline? Whether um, it's a short presentation, or I can actually quickly point out and say which are these topics. Uh, the first topic, it's on regenerative agriculture, which practices can combat climate change more effectively. And the second topic is, will cotton production be viable without government subsidies? And the third uh, topic is the sustainability challenge of biotech genetically modified cotton. Uh, we gave a little bit of a brief background on each of these. If you are keen on listening to the background, we could uh, also do that. But these are the three topics, Professor Talpur. 
Um, so I think we'll let uh, Dr. Talpour, we'll let you have time to digest that um, while we take some other comments and then we can come back to you um, afterwards. Uh, let's, let's move to um, Russia, please. Um, Victoria, can we give Victoria the floor? The floor. Thank you. There's a little bit of a time lag as we try to connect. Victoria? I think we're having some difficulties there. Um, let's move. Let's move quickly onwards, then, please, to um, uh, Mr. Patrick Packnett from USA. Please. We have the floor. Uh, thank, thank you, um, Kai, and others of the Secretariat, and. Um, uh, thanks for putting on the very uh, useful and interesting session that we heard this morning. Uh, in terms of the topic uh, for the uh, next uh, technical seminar, uh, the U.S. strongly endorses topic number one. Uh, we believe that uh, it uh, offers the best opportunity to learn about, you know, as an emerging concept uh, that is really the future of agricultural production. Uh, that will allow us to maximize the use of natural resources uh, while limiting the environmental impact of production and also reduce the impact of climate change uh, and even also to help ensure uh, and increase the profitability of producers around the world. Uh, we've noted in, in past sessions the importance of uh, building and maintaining soil health so I think this uh, continues in, in the line of highlighting uh, the importance of the soils uh, for our producers. So we strongly endorse uh, topic number one. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Patrick. And um, let's move quickly on. Let's try Russia again. Vic, can we give the floor, please, to uh, Victoria Kadash? She's still having the floor. I just messaged her, telling her to check her camera and me. Okay. All right, well, let's move then quickly to uh, Dr. Lastus from Uganda. Please, please give him the floor. Floor. Thank you. Dr. Lastus, can you hear us? Dr. Serinjogi? Yes, please. He's coming on now. There he is. Hey, great to see you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I thank you all the organizers for this wonderful virtual ICAC plenary meeting. And the, um, on the topic for the um, for technical seminar, Uganda and this Cotton Development Organization, which is the coordinating agency in particular, is suggesting that we, we take on the third topic um, on sustainability and the challenges of the biotech uh, cotton. This is the, uh, they, uh, there are a number of reasons, and the, this is given to even in today's uh, second presentation, the foregoing presentations, uh, which was on the, on the future of organic cotton, GMO cotton, and hybrid cotton. It is realized in those, that presentation how the low ebb of GM cotton is in Africa where we've got it only now produ producing in Sudan, um, Nigeria, and Kenya. And yet there, we have seen some advantages in other countries here developing it. So we are thinking that if we address that topic, we should be able to discern the problems as to why um, biotech cotton has it caught up in Afghan countries. And in such areas, such uh, discussion will help us even to be able to brief our um, legal and policy formulators so that we quicken the steps of um, legalizing cotton production in Africa. As you have seen, for example, the case where one country was quoted taking 10 years to, to, to reach 
um, a, a, legal state, a legal status for producing um, um, GM cotton. So we request that we take on the third topic on the sustainability of biotech cotton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lasters. Um, let's um, let's try. Uh, we're still having difficulty trying to get through to you, Victoria, uh, in Russia. Um, uh, you're still not appearing on the screen. So let's try and uh, connect with Dr. Prasad, please. Um, can we give the floor to Dr. Prasad? Yeah. <clears throat> Greetings to all. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, Dr. Yes. Prasad, it's good to see you. Um, you have the floor now. Yeah. I think uh, among the three topics, I would rather go with uh, regenerative agriculture, the first one, because there is so much buzz around uh, regenerative agriculture. The next step, um, over and above the organic cotton that is there, which focuses on soil health, climate change, and such other sustainability is also addressed in this topic. And also, uh, if uh, how, the, how these sustainable practices can be, uh, what kind of work is going on, and then how best these can be really uh, be in terms of uh, productivity, profitability, and then uh, sustainability issues. I think they also will address the scope for uh, uh, the subsidy component also in one way could be addressed. So in one topic, we have all the three in one. So I think we would rather go with regenerative agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. And um, can we give the floor to uh, Dr. Kim Sambayev, uh, if you can just introduce yourself and remind me where you're from? Yeah, the floor. It's not coming on. It's not coming on at the moment. Um, he is disconnected again. Okay, um, let's uh, let's try um, uh, let's try uh, Doctor Nagib. Uh, we had a little bit of a success there, so we've got one step further. But we'll try him again from from Sudan. Doctor Nagib, can we please give him the floor, and then we'll take uh, Russia. We'll try Russia again. He has the floor. We're not definitely not having luck can with. You, oh we're, we're, yes, we do, Doctor Nagib. We can uh, we can okay, see can, see can you. you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, can you hear me? welcome. Yes, we can you hear you. Um, Thank you. In this uh, opportunity, I, I, I would like to subscribe to the sustainability uh, issue because my country offers a uh, great opportunity in both sector uh, and sector as well. Uh, the scheme uh, alone in Central Sudan, we use uh, 500 uh, acres of cotton. Now, now this is dominated by hybrid, the Indian hybrid. Of uh, seed germination, seed germination, and farmers are complaining for uh, uh, low seed germination and many problems pertaining to the uh, uh, destruction of. Uh, of Uh, 30 years, uh, uh, and now good uh, thank we again uh, of 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 cotton. Uh, not only in in the in, in the, the in the uh, 
in the in the area. But there are in 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 Sudan in the refit sector. Uh, We have seven. Uh, this is a Brazilian Brazilian cotton and An enlightened farmer says to me that this uh, we don't have the, the foundation, the foundation seed, uh, and the uh, black side is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is now being resisted from, from which uh, we decide are very important. Uh, and offer this uh, potential for uh, not only for uh, uh, we want to take back. We can help uh, the country, uh, uh, not not by uh, international aid, but uh, uh, by uh, uh, partnership, smart partnership uh, uh, with international cooperation. And uh, I hear stand invitation for ICAC to visit uh, this uh, this vast uh, and initial for cotton uh, and, and uh, tech, uh, uh, industry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank okay. you, uh, Dr. Naguib. Um, I noticed that the, the hand is up for um, the Central Cotton Research Institute in Multan, but uh, I, I need to remind you that Dr. Talpour has already given the, um, the vote for Pakistan. Um, so we, we can't have another vote from Pakistan. Um, we're not having great uh, luck with connecting with uh, Russia. Uh, maybe Russia can add their vote into the chat at least, um, so we can get a few more um, comments and understanding on which topic to, to choose. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Talpour, in Pakistan, you want, to, um, you want to come back. Can we give the floor, please, to Pakistan? Internet of the Britain. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, Dr. Kim Sambayev has written in Russian, which unfortunately I'm not fluent in, so I'm unable to. Ah, Uzbekistan and Russia support topic number one. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's uh, that's been very helpful. Thank you um, to, for that. Um, so we so we have, um, as I see it now, uh, Dr. Cranthy, I, I see that there is a. Um, a support for topic number one as it stands at the moment. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, did we I, did we take Dr. Tanga before? Or we did. Well, could we not get through? No, we couldn't get him through. Okay, so can we give the floor to Dr. Tanga, and if you can remind me where you're from, so. Thank you. Dr. Tanga, he's not coming on yet. Oh, he's coming on now. Dr. Tanga, um, can you hear us? Make sure you're not muted and um, the floor is yours. No, that's not working. We're still not being able to hear you, Dr. Tanga. Um, if you have a vote, um, please put it in the chat, at least then we can register it that way. Um, but we're not able to connect with you, unfortunately. 
He's put, I think he's put it in the chat now. And okay, we have from Dr. Negum from Egypt, we have a vote for number two. Ah, we have, <laughs> um, we have a conflict there, uh, Dr. Negum, uh, because uh, Cat, Catco actually is the um, is the coordinating agency. So Catco have voted for topic number one. So I'm afraid it, it's they are the coordinating agency. Uh, we've registered the vote for Uzbekistan. I, I think we 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 have a runaway winner now, uh, uh, Keshav. So maybe we we don't need to make any more votes yeah thank you kai if there's no further voting yes uh, one from, i think i'd one just from... like to briefly read out which countries have supported uh, topic one and which countries have supported topic three uh may i do that yes you can there's there's a vote from sirad for for topic one and i presume they're representing the eu okay that makes it even more stronger then yeah so um, we have seven votes for topic one, which is from uh, from Sirad. Uh, we presume it is from uh, the EU, from uh, Sirad, Egypt, United States, India, Russia, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan. Uh, so that is an uh, overwhelmingly strong vote. And for topic three on sustainability of biotech cotton, we had two votes, which is from Uganda and Sudan. So. Uh, I think it's a kind of a unanimous vote for topic one. I I think we have we I think we have a, a winner, and I think we can um, leave it there. And my grateful thanks for those who made interventions. Um, I would now like to um, close this session, and uh, we will have a, a a very short break before we go come back to the World Cafe. So um, please let's come back at ten minutes to the hour when we can start the session for the World Cafe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Soundcheck, can you hear me? Mike, Thank you. just a few more seconds and then we'll get started. Okay, uh, well, welcome back everyone um, to our last session of the day, which is the World Cafe. And I'm gonna hand over immediately to the ICAC Director of Communications, uh, Mr. Mike McHugh, who will introduce the session. Uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and greetings to all my friends and colleagues around the world. Uh, I am indeed Mike McHugh, ICAC Communications Director, and I'm going to be moving fast today because we have a lot to get through. So first about the World Cafe. This session was created back in 2013, and it's designed to be less about presenting to the cotton community and more about interacting with the cotton community. In a normal year when we're all together, there'd be hundreds of people spread across a dozen or more tables according to their preferred language, and they'd discuss the problems, I'm sorry, the, the questions uh, we gave them amongst themselves. At the end, a table representative would then stand up and give a, a short overview of the major topics they discussed and the ideas they came up with. But we can't be together in person this year because, you know, so we did our best to make the World Cafe work in a virtual format. Uh, this year, the topic was challenges and opportunities for sustainability, and these are the individuals who made it happen. Dr. Bruno Bichelier, Assistant Unit Director of Sarad, Mr. Manish Daga, Managing Director, Cotton Guru, Dr. Robert Zhu, Vice President, Taiwan Textile Research Institute, uh, Dr. Zhu, I apologize. I'm almost positive that I referred to you as Mr. in the slides, so uh, it is indeed Dr. Zhu. Uh, Mr. Ojbek Kimsenbave, uh, Professor, Vogelgrad University. Mr. Mark Masura, Senior Vice President, Cotton Incorporated. Mr. Alvaro Moreira, Senior Manager of Large Farm Programs and Partnerships at BCI. Mr. Marco Matunga, Director General of the Tanzania Cotton Board. Dr. Mohamed Negum, Chairman of ICRA, Dr. Marcelo Petas, Director of Inta Argentina, and Mr. Alan Williams, General Manager of R&D Investment at CRDC. Uh, all speakers at ICAC plenary meetings dedicate a lot of time and effort to their presentations, and we are grateful to all of them. But the people you see on this screen right now had to personally identify and then recruit between eight and 20 experts to participate in their roundtable discussions. Then they had to somehow find a time when all of those people were available to hold it, then spent two or more hours discussing all the questions we provided them, and then they compiled all that information and made the brief summary videos we're about to watch. Uh, I would ask for a round of applause, but I don't think the platform we're using in this meeting has an applause button. I would hit it now if I could. Uh, Roundtables were held in eight languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Hindi, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. So this was a very big favor, and we could never have done this you know, without the generous help of all of our industry allies and friends. So to every person I just named, we owe you one. So now we will watch all the floor for questions. Uh, I know not all of the table moderators were able to be here today due to scheduling conflicts and some time differences, but I'm pretty sure I counted at least eight. So let's begin. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Masura from Cotton Incorporated, and I'm pleased to provide this summary report of the discussion group on social sustainability in cotton conducted as part of the World Cafe for ICAC. Six individuals were recruited as part of the World Cafe discussion group, and you can see that we uh, uh, included people with uh, specialties in global sustainability and specifically in social responsibility uh, as well. Uh, participants were from global companies and brands as well as consultants and communications professionals specializing uh, in the industry. Uh, one individual was not able to participate in the discussion but was part of some earlier informal communications. 
The discussion group began by looking at the ICAC statement on social sustainability and cotton production systems. This statement was provided ahead of time and allowed participants to reflect on, on the, the comments made by ICAC to really provide a context and frame uh, the discussion. The work of the discussion group then focused on four key questions. And the first of those questions was, do we agree as a discussion group with the ICAC statement on social sustainability? The consensus of the discussion group was that the statement mixed the topic of mechanization with social sustainability. And it was the feeling of the discussion group that mechanization really is a separate technology centered topic, not something that should be viewed as a trade off uh, in terms of uh, mechanization versus labor or versus social sustainability. It's really a separate topic. The second question allowed each of the discussion participants to weigh in um, from their perspective and talk about different sections of society that might be most vulnerable. And you can see in the highlight here some of the, the key points that were made that the least powerful are always the most vulnerable. There was a comment that migrant workers are also important and should be considered as part of a, a vulnerable section of society. And then some participants, particularly the brands in the discussion group, noted their company's focus on women and children. Question three dealt with measurement and metrics and indicators for social sustainability. There was a great suggestion from the discussion group about reviewing the previous guidance issued by the SEEP working group of ICAC. Also comments were made about making sure that core ILO standards, International Labor Organization standards, should be consistently applied across countries. And then brands in the call and discussion noted that they really don't delve too deeply into the workings of the supply chain. Most of their efforts are at tiers one and two, and that uh, the question of indicators is really a, a level of detail that most brands and retailers are not familiar with. The last question considered in the discussion group was about metrics that could incorporate the positive social impact of cotton production and processing. In particular, farm income and employment measures were noted. There was a call uh, in, uh, among members to make sure that neutral data are used, not data that favor a particular outcome. And that, uh, again, the concept that overall, clear metrics really don't exist and are hard to identify. There was a consensus in the group and a recommendation to ICAC that much more discussion is needed before these types of metrics uh, can be identified or, or a consensus uh, around which metrics are most appropriate. Hello friends, welcome to this most important session of the ICAC World Cafe. ICAC World Cafe is an integral part of the ICAC annual event, which is happening this year in December 2021. I, Manish Daga from Cotton Group, have been given the task to ask as the moderator. And we have chosen a very elite group of stakeholders to represent the uh, sustainable cotton industry. The topic that we have chosen is responsibility of stakeholders in cotton sustainability. So uh, the stakeholders, speakers, our uh, panelists with me are Mr. Suresh Kota, Cotton Man of India, Chairman, Kota Group of Industries. Mr. Ganesh Kasipar, South Asia representative of God, a very good certified agency for extract industry in sustainability. Dr. Vinay Choudhury, the Chairman of Control Union, India. Mr. Kailash Larpuria, the Director and CEO of Indocom Industries Limited, a big textile brand and an integrated textile industry in India. Mr. Snehal Doshi, is the Director of Partex Organic Cotton Seed, a very integral part of the agri input industry in sustainable agriculture. Mr. Amrutrao Deshmukh, who is the highest yield award winner cotton farmer in India. Stakeholders, 
Now, first, our first job was to list the stakeholders of the sustainable cotton supply chain. ICAC had shared a list of stakeholders which included governments, scientists, industries, farmers, consumers. There was a consensus amongst the group that we need to add some new stakeholders to the list, considering the long supply chain of cotton textiles. Uh, then we deliberated on um, who would be those stakeholders, what could be their roles, responsibilities, and significance across the supply chain, and the list came out to be government, scientists, industries, farmers, consumers, added with agri-input companies, farm tech companies, and brands. While all the stakeholders play a very important part, the role of government and brands is most important in establishing sustainable and economically viable production systems to mitigate supply chain. Uh, impact of sustainable agriculture practices and climate change on stakeholders. Uh, this was an additional point of discussion amongst the group where we deliberated on how much is each and every stakeholder that was mentioned uh, before in this presentation aware of climate change and its impact on agriculture or what practices in sustainable um, agriculture to mitigate the climate change. The answer that we got is very, very shocking. The next point that we deliberated on was impact of climate change and cotton price volatility, which has been the most talked about um, subject during the year 2021. And cotton supply chain, which again is seeing a huge disruption and a huge, huge rebuilding uh, opportunity for all the stakeholders. The next point that we deliberated on was case India. India being the 50% supply of organic cotton to the world. Uh, is a very important case study. All of us uh, in the group discussed in detail what were the opportunities and what were the challenges of organic cotton in India. And um, most of the participants agreed that the opportunities were much more than the challenges if the stakeholders came together and uh, did something which was uh, far sighted and which was maybe sustainable on the farm level. To um, uh, adhere to the carbon footprint, the global warming issue, and the price volatility, volatility issue that is facing the industry. Thank you from this group on the responsibility of stakeholders in cotton sustainability. Sustainable cotton and climate change. By Dr. Mohammed Nim, Chairman of International Cotton Research Association. What is cotton tapping? The purpose of the world of cotton tapping is to discuss and provide guidance on the following topics the challenges of measuring sustainability of cotton production systems, stakeholders' responsibility of cotton sustainability, indicators of improved. Soil health, sustainability of ecology and the biodiversity in cotton production system, social sustainability in cotton production system, economic sustainability, the relationship of sustainable practices to climatic change, scoring sustainability, traceability, and delivery. There is 17 goals to transform our world. This is made by United Nations. Why sustainability? Retailers, brands, and consumers are increasingly interested and pressured to promote sustainability throughout the supply chain. Climatic crisis and carbon fixation. The majority of plants, species on the earth, Cotton, for example, use C3 carbons. This is photosynthesis in which the first carbon compounds produce the contains three carbon atoms. C4 plants, including maize, sugar cane, and sorghum, avoid full respiration by using another enzyme called PEP during the first step of carbon fixation. C3 
These events, scope and cotton as well, are limited by carbon dioxide and may benefit from increasing the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide resulting from the climatic crisis. Sustainability in cotton production. In 2015, she published the report measuring the sustainability in cotton farming systems towards a guidance framework. The report gave an overview of sustainability themes and recommends a set of indicators to assess and measure progress on sustainability issue for cotton farming. There is 68 indicators. The question is, does we need to revise these indicators? There are three main pillars of sustainable development. SIP identified 11 key sustainability themes according to environmental protection, economic growth, social equality. There are several cotton initiatives worldwide. Some of them work with sustainable cotton and other work with organic cotton. The share of cotton produced under sustainable initiatives increased from 3.7% of global production in 2012 to 2013, to 2019 and 2020. The most extensive program is the Better Cotton Initiative, BCI. Up to date, there are 23 countries joining this initiative and produce and produce 6.2 million tons of cotton land in 19 to 2020. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Robert Joe, work for Taiwan Texas Research Institute. And I'm honored to be the moderator of ICAC World Cafe Roundtable Pre-Meeting for Taiwan Texa to discuss about cotton text sustainability. We have two in-person meetings with quite a diverse group of 16 people representing for different value chain manufacturers in Taiwan Texa industry. We chose four categories by voting out of eight categories provided by ICAC. The car two, we have proposed two initiatives for sustainable cotton processing. The first is if the stakeholders commit to using sustainable raw material such as organic cotton, BCI cotton, recycled cotton, and adapting production processes which have no environmental impact. The second, if circulation economy concept has been taken into account in the first place, the designer should think about the post treatment issue after use and the recycling problem. Regarding the classic economics, that's sustainabilities. There are two practices we can consider since the uh, consumer behavior is important. The communication and promotion strategy with the consumer could be very costly. Second, the data collection and the third-party assessment auditing from upstream to the downstream meals and logistics will spend a great deal of money as well. The climate change causes natural disasters, such as tsunami, floods, and droughts, which are harmful to human life. If the Earth's temperature continues to rise, human beings can no longer survive, and other species will face extinctions. If we promote the certification system or labels on cotton sustainability and traceability, 
for he knows the competitiveness of the cotton. The supply chain could consider effectively to blend synthetic fiber with the cotton fibers to make the entire product eco-friendly and sustainable. The last is not least. Scoring system or tool proposed by Texas Exchange PFM metrics and SAC Heat Index or US Cotton Trust Protocol for measuring sustainability or environmental impact should be aligned to scale up and to implement collectively. A unified system or standardized protocol will provide benefit to the use the cost for repeated certification assessment within the supply chain manufacturers. These are all we discussed in Taiwan with the textile industry from different sectors. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Alan Williams, and I'm the general manager for Canada Day Investment at the Australian Cotton Research and Development Corporation. I also co chair the Australian Sustainability Working Group. In a recent meeting, we took the opportunity to try and answer some of the questions currently posed by ICAC. Before I start looking at those questions, I'd just like to thank very much the members of the Sustainability Working Group for kindly agreeing to add these questions to the, to the meeting. The first question we looked at was, are you in favour of implementing a common global sustainability measurement system for cotton and translating it into a scoring system? We saw this as two discrete components. In terms of the measurement system, we felt very much it's not going away uh, and the better alignment on what we measure would be a good thing. We were concerned, of course, that the natural fibers in particular they needed to be accurate and it needs to reflect the context of the system. We don't believe that current systems do that well. But if it is done well, it should support ongoing efforts to improve sustainability of cotton ground and also the communications around that in the story of the cotton. We also felt that individual country systems uh, are important, uh, although they do need to align because they can be more agile, context specific and innovative. The global level, however, is a challenge given that different jurisdictions might mandate labeling laws that are broader than just cotton. So this is where the single scoring system becomes really challenging, we think, because it has to take into account things other than cotton. But how do we ensure that the special circumstances of cotton are, ta are taken into account but then not have lots and lots of different systems that compete, especially if retailers and brands, as we thought, would only like to have one system. We're not going to have multiple systems. The second question we looked at was the uh, different stages of sustainability and what are the most critical stages from a challenge point of view. We felt very much that data collection is the starting point for this. Without good data, you can't do anything. But of course, given the number of growers involved and the logistics and the costs, good data collection that you're confident in the data is a real challenge. We also thought that traceability is a real challenge. Uh, we need to ensure that increased traceability and the scrutiny that that can lead to where cotton is grown doesn't lead to regions or growers being penalised for factors outside their control. For example, seasonal variations which affect the sustainability score of their cotton. So perhaps traceability should really focus on going to a national level only in the first instance, rather than trying to get to a farm level, which is going to be very expensive. The third question we looked at was, is it possible to convey the sustainability metrics linked to a fabric that the consumer purchases? And if it is, please list some ideas about how to uh, sensitize consumers. To be honest, we didn't think that can be done in a way that genuinely reflects the complexity of the natural system. That is, you can't put a complex system into a single score. However, we know that the consumers and the media look for a simple number. So we need to be able to address that demand without dumbing down a complex system into a number that's not accurate. 
So I guess for the next kind of main matrix, we need supporting data in the context to make sure that that complexity and conceptual information is available, and that the concept of trade-offs is also available. A simple, simple single number does not, cannot reflect that there are trade-offs between all parts of the system. Some parts will be better than others, but how does a single score reflect that trade-off? The last question we looked at was to suggest two strategies to score and label blended fabrics for sustainability. So the first thing we said was we need to ensure they take into full account the impact of non natural fibers. So for example, the extractive impacts and the end of uh, life uh, breakdown of products. And as I flagged in the previous slide, we also need to make sure that they take into account trade-offs. Natural systems are complex. We need to make sure that, that complexity is understood or at least recognized in whatever scoring system might be used. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alvaro Moreira from Better Cotton, working with large farm programs and partnerships. I'm happy to have moderated a ICAC World Cafe Roundtable. For this occasion, we gathered a group of Portuguese-speaking colleagues from Brazil and Mozambique that you can see in that list. Our discussion focused on the challenges of measuring sustainability of cotton production systems. We shared this statement with participants before the roundtable. We structured our discussion around four different questions. The first one was, what are the main sustainability elements in cotton production systems? Or what comes to your mind when we talk about sustainability? At first, we covered some well-known elements, such as water consumption, soil health, pesticide use and toxicity, and decent work. The economic aspect was strongly linked to the other elements. We agreed that we need to consider the soil as the industry's main asset. And as such, soil health is a critical economic element of sustainability. Hence the mention to a shift, a shift of focus towards regenerative agriculture. The second question was, what metrics could be adopted to measure sustainability? First of all, we agreed that any metric needs to be adapted to local realities, resources, and capacity. Then we talked about the importance of measuring carbon sequestration and how cotton farming contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, we suggest a stronger focus on the social impact of cotton farming, on the jobs created, and on the economic impact in local communities. The third question was, what are the challenges you face to adopt metrics and measuring tools? We have identified a challenge in making metrics that are shared globally and at the same time easily understood by farmers. Also, the reporting tends to stress negative impacts, diverting the attention from positive achievements. The lack of statistics and of capacity to collect the data in some contexts also needs to be addressed. Finally, the fourth question was, how can the industry support farming communities in measuring sustainability? We suggest the development of common initiatives that provide a framework for reporting and the promotion of technical protocols. Also, we agreed that we can encourage broader, broader change by highlighting more the existing good practices and the positive outcomes. We also suggest that the definition of targets needs to correspond to local realities. Finally, two key elements need further support. These are the traceability programs in the development of technologies that enable more efficient production systems.
Yes. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Malcolm Tunga uh, from Tanzania Cotton Board. Um, we met a group of eight people to discuss the challenges and the opportunities on sustainable cotton. Well, uh, for sustainable cotton to be sustainable, everyone uh, in the value chain need to be conscious of the health of the soil, but also the environment. And one of the important aspects which came out from our discussion was, first of all, in Africa, taking an example, um, many of the farmers are smallholder farmers. And in order to make it easier to implement a sustainable, a growing sustainable cotton, we must first register all farmers digitally. By so doing, uh, it will help to identify the farmers, but also it will simplify training of farmers on the best practices uh, where farmers can get the knowledge to do it right um, from the way they cultivate the land, but what to apply um, in terms of fertilizers and um, pesticides. That is very key uh, if we are to actually uh, sustain this movement. But the group did identify two important researchable issues. One, um, sustainability of the whole uh, issue of growing sustainable cotton uh, revolves around uh, where will I get, uh, for example, organic products uh, to spray. So in Africa, what is really key, we need uh, to manage to extract uh, products which will be legally available to the farmers to spray their crops. If we are talking about uh, neem uh, tree, neem oil, and the like, we need to have small uh, industries where they can be produced and farmers can access them easily uh, as they are getting the conversion of pesticides from the market that will actually play a big role to make uh, many farmers adopt uh, the sustainable practices of growing cotton. But the second issue is uh, we have a resurgence of many pests and diseases. And uh, these, uh, some of them can actually be addressed. Uh, through breeding. So breeding pr practices need to actually get into the momentum of making sure that uh, we do have some uh, programs which will address uh, the issue of um, pests uh, and diseases, but also um, outcome of climate change. For example, uh, we must come um, uh, with varieties which are tolerant uh, to harsh weather and unpredictable uh, conditions. Uh, those were uh, most important researchable issues which were identified. On the law of prayers, for example, if you are talking about uh, retailers um, of uh, sustainable products, First of all, they need to continue to demand from their suppliers. Uh, they are there to sustainable methods of getting those uh, produce and products, that is one. But also it is important 
for suppliers to be paid the premium, which subsequently will trickle down to farmers. Uh, this will ensure that everyone who is in the value chain will see the benefit of actually engaging in producing sustainable cotton. Um, and of course, if you talk to, if you look at um, how um, textile and garments are produced, uh, at the level of weaving and dyeing, uh, we need actually uh, to see them. They are using uh, natural dyes instead of synthetic. That will go a long way uh, to make sure that uh, we, 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 we get to a point where uh, what uh, is produced is in real terms sustainable. I thank you very much. Okay, hey Mike, I think we're back to you. Yeah, well, I wanted to thank, obviously, all of the uh, the roundtable moderators. I think we had some, some audio problems there, so keep in mind that we will get this on YouTube as quickly as we can, and we will send an announcement out when that, when that is available, if there was anything you missed there. Um, we did get some questions in. Uh, Kai, should I handle those, you? Yes, you, you handle them. Um... Sure. Uh, the first one was for uh, Bruno Bichelier. Uh, Bruno, it says, it appears that SEEP's work on cotton sustainability indicators is not always well known. What can be done to improve this situation? Uh, Bruno, so if you can raise your hand, we will give you, the, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bruno, for that. I have a question for Mr. Manish Daga, if you can raise your hand. Uh, the question is, 
what is the level of awareness amongst among stakeholders for climate change? Manish, you have the floor. Yes, uh, I hope you can he see and hear me both. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so hi, all of you. And it's a very important question because what happens down the uh, stakeholders uh, supply chain is the more higher we go, the less awareness we found. Within our group, we discuss a lot about each stakeholder and about the awareness level amongst each stakeholder, the stakeholders being government, scientists, industries, farmers, consumers, agri-input companies, brands, uh, and farm tech companies. We found that while the growers are rapidly becoming aware of the rising climate risk, few companies that solely or partially rely on cotton for their products know much less about those trades. The consumers even know lesser. Mother Nature seems to be very, very angry at our lethargic approach towards climate change. The recent cold wave flooding in India, the chilling winter in China, La Nina in Latin America, last year's heat wave in North America. Is that not a warning enough? The recent agroclimatic changes and extreme price volatility in cotton should serve as a wake-up call for the cotton and textile industry. That was what was deliberated amongst uh, the group regarding awareness uh, of climate change on the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question for uh, Alvaro Moreira, if you can shake your, uh, raise your hand, please. Um, someone just specifically asked if you could elaborate on the concept of soil as an economic asset. Are you there, Alvaro? Okay. Okay, I'm not sure. I saw him earlier. He might not be on. If he can raise his hand. Okay, I'm not sure if he's on. He was on earlier, but we'll we will go along uh, to the next question. Uh, and this was not directed to anyone in particular, so any of our um, table moderators is welcome to answer it. Um, it says you have talked about the various stakeholders that have a stake in sustainability. What is the awareness level of their responsibilities? And are people accepting that challenge or are they resisting it? So that is open to any of the table moderators that wants to address that. Uh, raise your hand if you... Do not see. Mike, we Manish has the floor and he's he's there. Okay. Yeah, my, may I take the liberty to answer this? Yes. Yes, I spoke about this just two minutes ago and I would like to add that the sooner we realize the stakeholders, we found that the governments and brands are the two paramount um, stakeholders so whose importance cannot be neglected to uh, in the sustainable uh, stakeholder supply chain. They have to take the initiative in establishing sustainable and economically viable production systems to combat or mitigate climate change. We found that a lot of policies of the governments are not implemented at ground level. Many of the governments are not having long-term policies. This puts away the investors, that is, shies away the investors from, uh, you know, um, putting a lot of money in the high, already capital-intensive industry, which is textiles. The second is the brands. They are the ones who demand. They are the ones who can drive any change. We cannot expect the farmers to initiate that change, neither the researchers. They can do their best within that capacity. But it is the government and the brand who should really drive this change. Excellent. And I see Dr. Negum also has his hand up. So if we can give him the floor, Dr. Negum.
Thank you, Dr. Negum. Um, there, I see in the chat, uh, I believe it's from Dr. Ramkumar. Uh, it says, um, we all agree sustainability is important, but um, it's where the rubber meets the road. It's cost, cost, and cost. Unless the industry collectively talks about the associated cost, we have a hard sell to compete against other fibers. Please kindly elaborate and enlighten. So any of our answering that question, please raise your hand. Okay, and I think um, questions came in. It's for Doctor. Yeah, Mike, uh, I I have one before you do the final one, but uh, so, okay, um, uh, which is from Marcella uh, Marcella Paitas. Um, good to see you on there. He's got his hand up, but I'll read his question. Um, he asks, according to your presentation, it seems that not all countries in Latin America and the Caribbean are part of any of the cotton sustainability initiatives. Why? Um, well, good afternoon to everybody. Um, um, what we discussed in the, in the meeting, basically with all the different countries in South America, is that the feeling is that initiatives available are not really interested or they are less focused in those countries with low uh, productivity in terms of yield, in terms of fiber. So that's why we are concerned and we do believe that we need to, to think about the way that we can strengthen the networking for a better collaboration of all the organizations for small farmers uh, to be part of this change. So um, we, we are quite concerned about that that we need a initiative, um, maybe more accurate to low yield cotton production system. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And there is just one last one. Um, this is for Professor uh, Oybeck. And the question is, are the different aspects of sustainability complementary or do they stand alone? Must social, economic, and environmental sustainability evolve together or on separate tracks? So, Professor, if you raise your hand. Sorry, Beck. I can see he's online. Perhaps spell the name, uh, Mike. It's O, it's o, o Y B E K. Oh, there we go. Okay. Professor, you have the floor.
Я ответил, я Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I do believe we are just about out of time. To once again, give a, a, a huge thanks to all the moderators, including the couple that were not able to be here today. They put in an awful lot of work. We know this is only the beginning of the of the discussion about sustainability, and there's a, a long way to go. But this it has to start somewhere, and I think we got a good start here. We'll be following up uh, with more information uh, after the event and, and producing a, a report on some of the findings that we weren't able to discuss uh, publicly today. So I think that uh, that is it for us. Um, Mr. Chair, over to you. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank you for a very interesting session, some really useful comments coming out there. Um, we'll now move very quickly into the closing plenary session and, uh, and the closing remarks. Um, the chair is online. Uh, Chair, if you're happy, I will uh, give some closing remarks and leave the, the final remarks to yourself. Yes, please, Kai, go ahead. Thank, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so my first thanks must go to all of you, the participants who um, helped make this uh, a very successful virtual plenary meeting over the past three days, and uh, to my team at the Secretariat for working so diligently behind the scenes um, because it is behind the scenes, you don't uh, see the work that goes on. And I can tell you there's, a, there's an awful lot of that and a lot of very late nights. Uh, and my, my final thanks must go to uh, the interpreters who have had to um, uh, deal with some challenging situations, um, especially when the technology hasn't been so good. And my, my grateful thanks go to them um, for helping us make this. Um, so the... The virtual plenary meeting has raised some challenges, um, not just uh, the technical issues, and, uh, and perhaps it highlights the importance of uh, improving technology, um, but also in the way that we structured the virtual plenary meeting. Um, we had to reduce the time um, almost by half um, because we had to ensure that we could cover as many time zones as possible uh, during the, the three days, uh, and um, so that you could all, uh, as many people as possible, could participate. Um, but we have learned from that, and uh, and it, uh, these this virtual plenary meeting has provided the base for moving forward. So um, we also needed to choose the most pressing and important subjects um, to cover over just a few days, whilst also retaining the traditional uh, subjects um, associated with the opening ceremony. And uh, we had some really excellent topics um, like hybrids and labeling. And I, and I really would like to uh, just comment on two sessions in particular, not because they were better than any others, but for other reasons. Um, and that is, first of all, the labeling session, um, which was the first topic that was chosen by the private sector and uh, created a great de deal of interest and debate and showed the value of, uh, of including the private sector in the plenary meetings moving forward. And uh, finally, to today's session on the World Cafe, uh, ironically, this format um, allowed us to be more flexible and perhaps reach a wider and more diverse audience than we could within the traditional plenary meeting session. And it allowed us to focus those messages and deliver them to you today. And I would like to once again thank all the participants um, on the, uh, the, the various uh, tables who helped make that uh, such a successful uh, session. And uh, looking ahead, and I know the chair most probably will touch on this, um, we still are in a period of uncertainty. Um, so until we uh, move out of that period, we will, it is our intention, and it still has to be discussed, I, I hasten to add, by the steering committee and uh, the standing committee, but it is my intention to propose that we conduct another virtual plenary meeting next year um, so that we know that we can actually have a meeting um, for you. So with that, uh, my grateful thanks to everyone once again, and um, uh, Chair, back to you for the final remarks. Thank you, Kai. I also wish to congratulate the delegates and participants on a successful 79th plenary of the ICAC. So there have been excellent presentations and discussions. 
and the icac secretariat led by uh, executive director mr kai hughes has worked very hard to organize this plenary and i was uh, a witness to that i mean i i uh, attended uh, uh, one of their uh, one of their sessions and despite several, several technical challenges and and the technical challenges are bound to come kai uh, you try to make it as close to an in person experience as possible so a heartful heartfelt appreciation for the team i do believe that the participants found all the sessions informative and were able to ask their questions thank you again to all delegates for attending and icac secretariat for making this possible and as kai mentioned that though there is this is a time of uncertainty and pandemic and the new mutants and the new variants uh, and there is also some uncertainty over the format of the next plenary and we of course we will all like to have an in person plenary if possible but even if it is a virtual plenary i do invite all participants to join us for the same thank you and namaste thank you chair and thank you everyone and Goodbye until next time. Bye.